Ladies and gentlemen, our referee has called a stop to this contest, declaring the winner by knockout and new MMA Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting round of and new MMA show. I'm your host, Michael Hansen, and I do everything with microphones because I'm a ring announcer at the end of this year. And I'm joined by my two co-hosts, as I am every week, introducing first from New York in the camo. He's Mark Prio. What's up, buddy? What's up, boys? Happy New Year. Happy to be back doing a little uh, award episode. I love these. So, yeah, this this should be a fun one. But, yeah, cheers to everybody. Happy New Year's. I cheers, am bud. completely ghosted out by the light tonight. The light is extra powerful. Are you in a tanning booth? I think so. I believe I am. <laughs> by the oh. end of this episode, Mark is going to have a, a nice golden leather tan. Yeah. yeah. And introducing from Florida, the Sunshine State. He is... The Nicaragua Nightmare. Omar Artola. What's up, man? What's going on? Uh, it's nice to be back. It's nice to have the new year. The gym has no chill. They don't give a shit if it's the first day of the new year. They ran us right into the ground. Uh, but it's good to be back. I actually had, I realized I hadn't really been training a lot in December because of the vacations, and I got sick at one point and all this other shit, so I hadn't actually gone to the gym to train for a while, but... Uh, I am back, and I have been humbly reminded that I suck at sparring. So, let's go 2023. Nice, man. Nice. Uh, I just got back from my holiday travels. By the way, how's my mic? Does it sound okay? It's better so now. Far, so far, so good? It's better. So far, so yeah. good. Just All right. Yell. I'll try not to. Um, Opposite of last episode where you were... Yeah. Holding someone captive you, in your basement. He was baby <laughs> whispering us last last episode. <laughs> from my in-laws. Speaking of, I just got back from my all of my holiday travels, visiting my in-laws and my folks quickly, and uh, long car drive back to Michigan. But we made it, and I I brought my stuff with me. But uh, that's probably might be why my recording might sound a little off because I'm plugging it all back in. You know. I'm also not 100%, I'm going to say right now, because sometimes I bite my lip, sometimes I bite my tongue. This week I bit both my lip and my tongue. So I sound, I might sound like I'm really drunk. It happens when you have big fucking teeth like I do. Like way too often. Your mic is so hot right now, too. It's oh my God. Dude, I turned the level down. <laughs> You're just screaming oh my God. about biting your lip and tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking first world problems. Okay. Well, folks, we have a, a fun episode for you this evening. Quickly, we're going to recap uh, the main fights from the Bellator versus Ryzen from New Year's Eve. It went down in Japan. That's so cool, man. My buddy Tariakin said, uh, you're not a real fight fan until you go watch fights in Japan. Until you go? Until you watch fights in Japan, is I think is what he tweeted out or something like that. But like in person? Yeah, he used to like live in Japan. Uh, for oh, well, for not a, all of for us can fucking go live in Japan. I know, man. I'm like, am I really not a real fight fan? And because I've never been to Japan. Quite a big ask. I would love to go to been, Japan. Been, Japan seems cool. I've been quite around the country a little bit to see at least you know some real professional MMA events. I don't always have a few thousand dollars to drop to just go to Japan. <laughs> I, I will say I love and I will always love the Japanese audience because that's an audience I can get behind, man. I feel like Dude, if I went and I, but but they do you like but, way but after more reactive every than they usually are. But the, but the end part is is fantastic. The fight is ended. Everybody hugs. The people are all cheering. They're all clapping Great. nice, respectfully. Yeah. There's nobody yelling out, "Grab his dick!" Like it's a it's a fantastic <laughs> yeah. environment, and but it looks really fun fight, to be around those people. Usually mid fight, they're a lot more quiet. And they were kind of reacting a lot. Even um, even Morrow said it. He was like, "This crowd is uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically excited." Yeah, they are quiet when they're reading the decisions, which I thought was very different from how it is in the UFC fights. Uh, they were pin drop silent when they were reading those decisions and the scorecards. It was yeah. 
I love the Japanese, man. I, I love oh, that whole Japanese fight culture. <laughs> I love the way they announce it. It's like, no. Uh, it's so cool, man. So Oops. cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, after we recap the Bellator versus Ryzen, uh, we're going to dive inside the MMA sphere and get the updates on the headlines with Omar. Then we're going to look back at our end of 2021 predictions about who's going to be the champions of right by the end of this year. Okay. Okay. Then we're going to do our awards. Recapping the end of this year, actually. And it'll be cool to compare and see what, uh, how our predictions line up with, with our awards this year and whatnot. And then we might end with a little bit of trivia. All right, boys. Well, that being said, let me let me get on with this thing. Before we get into any fight talk, let us thank our audience. If you're watching this right now on YouTube, thank you so much. If you could do us the greatest favor, like and subscribe and do all the things. Hit all the red buttons. Hit the bell icon so that you never miss an episode. Uh, if you like any of our takes and agree with them and want to want to compliment us for our vast MMA intellect, let us know down in the comments. And if you disagree with any of our takes, also let us know down in the comments. We love all the thoughtful back and forth if you want audio you only hey we thoughtful i know thoughtful. i know yes 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 um we'll see we'll see who gets left off of the uh fighter of the year if it, if, if uh, Mark doesn't get every award we're oh my... <laughs> women's fighter of the year or... <laughs> that's right um let's see if you want audio only, we got you there. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, find us on social media at and new underscore MMA show in all the places. All right. Let's get into this episode. This week, the name on the marquee has got to be AJ McKee, who this past weekend in Japan, Bellasaur versus Ryzen in the main events defeated Ryzen's Roberto de Souza by unanimous decision in a three-round lightweight bout. Mark, let me throw it over to you first. Uh, what was your take of McKee getting it done over de Souza and your impression of this very cool crossover event overall? I was going to say real quick, I just want to say how much I loved this event as a whole. I loved the whole vibe of it. It was so nostalgic for me. I loved the way they leaned into the pride vibes intros of all the fighters coming out you know where they stood um together as pride used to do before the fights even having morrow on the call i needed boss rootin on the call though would have been fucking awesome if they brought him back for it but um yeah I, I loved everything about the way they chose to present this event it was it felt like i was watching pride all over again so that was awesome <clears throat> uh as for aj uh and d'souza they, so i was saying d'souza last week that's how i've heard it before they were saying both on the broadcast so who freaking knows? I feel like Souza is usually the Brazilian pronunciation, but they were saying D'Souza more often, so I don't know. Call him Satoshi. Um, but, yeah, AJ entering as a samurai, first of all, was pretty dope. That was quite the costume that my man rocked to the ring. Um, but, yeah, he did really well in round one. This was a great fight, by the way. I loved this. This is probably my favorite fight on the card, I think. Um, but AJ did real well in round one. He defended perfectly. He was heavy on top, he did damage, and, and he kind of reminded everyone out of the gate that he can grapple as well. Um, D'Souza showed how slick he is, of course. He, he had a couple transitions that were beautiful, but AJ was ready. He didn't get caught. But then we get to round two, and we get AJ McKee trying to roll through when D'Souza was able to slide around and take his back, and he tries to roll out of it from, from a standing position and lets D'Souza wrap him up. And that's exactly why I was afraid to pick A.J. McKee, because he does things like that. And trying to roll through when D'Souza already is on your back standing is not the move in that spot. So shit like that is what made me concerned for A.J. McKee. And he got himself, you know, in a, in a body triangle. D'Souza had his back for whatever it was, two, three minutes. He did survive. But it was those kind of things that were making me think, like, man, he could end up in some trouble in this fight. And he flirted with it. Um, and that round was, was Satoshi's round. He had some real, he even had some nice mo moments on the feet um, in that fight. Or sorry, I should say was his round until the very end. 
And then AJ finally gets free with like 30 seconds left and lands some monster shots. So I kind of think he stole that one back, um, thankfully for him, because round three ended up being kind of tight. I'm not sure which way that one would have gone. So it, it was a close fight overall. Kind of a tough one to score for rounds two and three, depending how you look at it. I wanted to watch it again. I didn't have time to. Um, it did feel like the right man won. All these fights were fairly close, to, to be honest, other than Kyoji's, which we'll get to. Um, you know, Ryzen went 0-5, but they battled. But, yeah, I think the right man won. I was impressed by A.J. McKee. He, he was willing to grapple a lot, put himself in some tough spots, but mostly survived and, and, and did well. But it was a good showing for D'Souza, too, I think. Both, both guys look good. Omar, let's bring you in here. What was your impression of the event on the whole and of uh, McKee getting it done in the main event? I thought it was a fantastic fight. A um, couple of things that I took away was the ring definitely made a hell of a difference uh, as compared to the cage. Um, I think there were a couple times during the grappling exchanges, McKee was looking to push off of the cage and was like, oh, shit, that's air. There's nothing in between those ropes. <laughs> um, and I think it messed up some of the the... the Things I think he's acclimated to be doing in those motions, in those sure. in, in those Bellator cages. Um, I was also very surprised that McKee flirted with the ground game to the extent that he did. So I knew he would go down on the ground. I knew he would be or, or want to get top position. I knew he would be trying to do ground and pound. I did not expect him to throw up as many submission attempts against this man as he ended up doing. Um, I don't know if he realistically thought he'd be able to catch him, you know, try to cement something amazing in that in that respect because of the, the credentials that D'Souza comes with. Um, but it was kind of a weird flex because if there was one thing D'Souza was going to be significantly good at, it was going to be that part of the game. And you would imagine that A.J. McKee would try to exploit the striking or, or other areas where D'Souza may not be as talented. Um, but McKee was kind of ready to go everywhere. I think technically on the feet, you could see A.J. McKee was better. Um but the the fight was so grappling heavy that I think the cardio got both of them. Um, you can see by the third round, both of them wanted to sit down. I mean, they were they were exhausted by the third round. Um, AJ McKee was turning his back and walking away. I mean, he was pulling some Nate Diaz shit in the third round. Um, it was it was very interesting. Um, I enjoyed the fight though. It was a scrap from beginning to end. There weren't a lot of dead moments there. Um, just a lot of surprising choices from AJ McKee regarding a lot of the submission pulls that I, I, I just didn't see coming. For better or worse, and I guess so far it's been better. You could argue that he has not lost a fight if you scored that pitbull rematch for him. But for better or worse, he's one of these guys, I think, who thinks he is better no matter what aspect or angle of a fight he's in. He just believes it. Like, I, I don't think he cares. Like, if he was in a striking match with fucking Alex Pereira, I think he'd be like, well, yeah, I, I can handle it. Like, I just think that's his mindset, that he thinks he's that good everywhere. Mm. Yeah, it was uh, it was striking to see him so tired towards the end of that fight. And I think you're right. I think maybe the change of environment was part of it, and being in a ring with ropes was part of it. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, he went I also... and. and D'Souza yeah. pushes a pace like you don't may not realize yeah. it because it's you're on the ground but like he is making you work you got to move yeah. to defend in every freaking split second because he's going from setup to setup to setup to set like you you're moving the whole time and for those of you who are watching and, and perhaps not appreciating what you're seeing I can promise you with all hell the, the grappling that you're watching is at least five times more intense than the striking that they put on yeah on on your body so if you're wondering why they're getting exhausted so quick grappling will kill you <clears throat> way faster than striking will in terms of your cardio. oh yeah so man. It, it, it was it was a tall order that fight by the end of it when you look at how much grappling went into it and, and and those small moments of striking that went in between and to be honest the pace never really stopped i mean they were go 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 from beginning to end all three rounds so it was it was it was an intense fight, man. It was good. I, I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic. The whole event I thought was fantastic, but this fight I thought was really good. A nice little way to to, to end it off. Yeah, man. You guys want to move on to the co-main event? Yeah, just throw out one last point. I would love it if they could. I mean, there's a lot of guys who you could argue should be in this lightweight Grand Prix that's coming up in Bellator. 
But I would love it if they could work some deal where D'Souza is in the Grand Prix. I think that'd be fun. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. All right. <clears throat> in the co-main event for Bellator versus Ryzen on New Year's Eve, Patricio Pitbull defeated Kleber Erbst by unanimous decision in a three-round featherweight fight. Omar, let me toss it over to you first this time. Give us your take of Pitbull getting it done in this event. If Pitbull was the same height as this man, <laughs> Kleber would have died. The same thing. Kleber <laughs> would have died. I tell you that right now. The size difference, and I don't need... We talked about the size difference last week, and we talked about how Pitbull is usually the smaller guy and whatever else. I didn't realize how much shorter this man was until I actually watched the fight. Um, and credit to, to, to Kleber for teeping the shit out of him for, like, three rounds. Uh, I mean, the man was front kick galore, jab galore. He did everything he could to keep Pitbull the fuck away from him, and I, I don't blame him. Um, it was a good game plan. Especially if you consider, you know, if, if you really believe you can keep him away from him and just keep striking him, that's points on points on points. Um, so it's not really a terrible game plan, especially when you know that Pitbull will lay you out with one clean shot. Um, especially, you know, if, if, if this was Pitbull, I think, from like five years ago, the Pitbull that literally would walk forward and not give a shit and, you know, w was super aggressive, this fight might have also gone a different way. But the Pitbull of late has very much been about, like, fuck the fans and what they like. I'm going to go in there and win the fight the way I want to win my fights. Um, and I'm going to do it with the least amount of damage or, or, you know, however his mindset is in those in those situations. So he was a lot less aggressive than I think he could have been. Um, and I think Kleber was able to, to kind of get off a lot more than I was expecting him to as a result. Um, with that being said, Pitbull definitely didn't take a ton of steps back. Um, like I said, Clever was really trying to keep him off of him the whole time, but Pitbull was having a lot of issues trying to find the entries. When he did, he did land some good shots, um, you know, and I think the the decision went the right way. But I will give Clever the, the 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 credit he deserves for putting on a fight that he did because I didn't think that the man had a chance in hell uh, inside of that ring with with Pitbull. So credit to him, man. It was a, again a, a much better fight competitively than I thought it was going to be. Mark, give us your take of Pitbull shining in the coming event. Yeah, I was going to make the same exact point of thank God that Kleber had the reach advantage that he had because he may not have lasted long if he hadn't. He was working the teeps. He was backing up. Also, thank God that it was a ring and not a cage because he was able to kind of put his back on the ropes and lean mm -hmm. his head another foot over the ropes so that Pitbull was having a hard time hitting them. Whereas if it was a cage, he wouldn't have had that option. His head wouldn't have been, been able to go backwards like that as Pitbull's walking him down all fight long. So I think in a cage, that might have ended a lot quicker, to be honest. But, um, yeah, it's, Pitbull is a wild fighter to watch. Because, so on, on one side, credit to Kleber, he was pushing a pace the whole fight. As much as, he, as much as he had to back up and kind of fight defensively at times, the pace never waned from Kleber. He was going the whole fight. But on, on the flip, watching Pitbull, and I don't mean, obviously, there is a lot going on, and the dude's an incredible counter striker and all this, but, like, if you're just on the face of it, he barely moves. Like, he kind of just stands there. Every 30 seconds, he, like, throws a combo. Even when he tries to defend a takedown, like, there's no big sprawl. There's no – he just stands there. He just shucks you off. He just moves you to the side. Like, it, it's almost like his feet – barely move it, it, he's a wild fighter to watch there's there's no large movement that, that comes from and, and it wasn't necessarily always that way but that's kind of how he fights now it's like you can't get him off where he wants to be standing and how he wants to be fighting um which is really unique especially for a guy of his size who's normally at a size disadvantage so he he's a really he's a strange fighter to watch but he looked good. He, he did win the fight. I think it went. I think the decision went the right way. I do think it was a lot closer than the announcers were making it seem. They were like talking about it like it was some big, huge landslide. I didn't see that. I thought it was fairly close, like unnecessarily close, in my opinion. I think Patricio had a chance to make a larger statement than he did, and he kind of just made sure he got the win and and got out of there. Um, but 
I mean, a win is a win. It's a relatively big win. He he did what he does. He's so good at handling range, at counter striking, um, at defending the takedown when he wants to. But it would have been nice to see him maybe hit the gas a little bit in in such a big spot. Pitbull is just so complete. He's just so dangerous everywhere. He's so good everywhere. At this point, he's such a veteran. He's a guy who don't 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 miss his fights, man. Because when this guy hangs it up, when he when he retires the gloves and lays them down in, in in the middle of the of the mat, if you haven't seen his fights, you're gonna regret it, man. Because he he is a pleasure to watch. He's he's everything any MMA fan wants. He he presents danger at all times. His technique is is excellent, and he's so well rounded. So. Props to him on getting a great win. I wish so badly that there was a way for us to see him fight UFC guys before it was all over. Like yeah. just to know, like, is he like is he losing to the top ten? Is he beating everyone that's not like Max and Volk? Is he beating Max and Volk? Like we we don't know. Yeah. We have theories, of course, on it. But I would I just wish we could know how truly good this man is because it's it's difficult to gauge. Yeah. Well said. All right, let's keep going down this Bellator versus Ryzen card on New Year's Eve in the flyweight division. Another win for Bellator when Kyoji Horiguchi defeated Hiramasa. Help me say this guy's name. Okikubu? Ogikubu. Ogikubo. Ogikubo. Also by unanimous decision in a three-round flyweight fight. Mark, let me stay with you here. Give us your take on Horiguchi getting it done, also for Bellator. So this, as I mentioned, was the one fight on this card that was not very competitive. Um, this thing was all Kyoji Horiguchi. That was the Kyoji that we know and love. Such great movement, so hard to track down in there, impossible to control, delivering strikes with big power for the weight class that he's in. And he fought great. Uh, round one, he looked great all of round one, but then by the end of it, like last 30 seconds of round one, he really beat the shit out of Hiramasa, and the fight kind of changed from there. He, he he really took control of that fight. And I said it last week, uh, Oigi Kubo just does not have the game to beat Kyoji Horiguchi. He, he would need everything to break so perfectly for him to find a way to win that style matchup. And it didn't here just like it hasn't in their previous two fights. It's I just I don't think it's a winnable matchup for him. And Kyoji looked great. He fought a really great fight. He hurt Hiromasa multiple times, controlled almost the entire fight, and, and adds another nice win to his resume. And just as a note, kind of a lot in the fight. Moro and Big John kept discussing how Kyoji is a natural flyweight and how they wish Bellator would add that division. So hmm. I don't know if maybe that was a bit of a teaser or if it was just them having a conversation. But if that was something that was coming, that would be pretty cool. That would be cool. Okay, Omar, uh, give us your take on Horiguchi getting it done. Yeah, uh, overall, I definitely think that Horiguchi took that one with no uh, no real problems. If there was anywhere that you want to give Ojikubo uh, credit for, you know, his ground game, he, he he did his best to try and present a problem uh, on the ground. That was really where a lot of his entries came from, a lot of his, his threats came from. Um, but he really succeeded, if anything, at getting control in certain points. Never really got to a point where he was causing damage. Um, in most of the situations where he did end up with control, Kyoji found a way to reverse or or, or remain in a, or get back into an advantageous position from there. Um, also, didn't know that you could your like torso could be between the ropes, and you could still be punching down at your opponent. I thought once you break the ropes, I thought they'd like stopped you and like moved you back into the center or something like that but no nah, they just they let homeboy just punch through the ropes it was really weird yeah i thought that was inter um, interesting too yeah so that that was new for me um but horiguchi was a step ahead man he was a step ahead i think the entire fight um like i said oji kugo had had some moments very few and far between when it came to the grappling exchanges but overall horiguchi was just he was all over him and it did get worse as the as the fight progressed you know round one was kind of a nice little ground teaser. They kind of made sure that they expressed who was the better guy versus, you know, in control and, and doing that stuff. And then when it got to round two, 
there was a little bit more action involved, the pace increased, um, the striking increased from the ground. But then once we got to round three, that's when shit kind of really hit the fan for Oji Kumbo and Kyoji just ran away with it. So, fantastic performance from Horiguchi. Yeah, man. Dominant. Uh, anything else you guys want to say about Kyoji? Okay. Uh, two more. Two more. In a three-round bantamweight bout, Bellator's Juan Archuleta got a split decision victory over Ryzen's Suchul Kim. Omar, sticking with you here, who do you think won that fight? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I don't really care, man. Um, that fight was awesome. That fight was absolute madness. That was the war of wars. Um, the Spaniard was probably the best name for him in that fight. Uh it, it was it was a great fight, man. I think one of the one of the things I loved about that fight was, I think when we talked about it, we talked about Archuleta being the better fighter, um, Kim kind of being you know more of a brawler, more of a you know more of a uh, an aggressive fighter that kind of uses the the opportunities presented from his aggression and, and taking people off of their comfort zones um, and, and taking advantage of those positions. This just it just this was an everywhere fight. I think Archuleta played a little bit more into Kim's game than I think even I thought was going to happen, um, and it made the fight very very competitive. Uh, I thought Archuleta would be a little bit more technical, especially on the feet when it came to the striking exchanges. Um, but Kim Kim did work, man. Kim Kim landed some good fucking shots on Archuleta. Some good shots. Both of them, I think, were opened up by the end of the fight. Archuleta had a few slices on his face. Um, Kim had nothing to ha I know he was disappointed by the end of the fight. I think he was one of the more visibly disappointed fighters uh, who lost that night. But to be honest, man, I thought he was the one who really gave the Bellator fighter a run for their money. Um, you know, one could argue that the Pitbull won. Pitbull could have done more and, and all this stuff. And But this one just seemed like they both just left everything there maybe even a piece of themselves not really sure but that was a crazy ass fight would watch again kim has nothing to hang his head about man that was a fucking that was a great fight mark do you think archuleta was the rightful winner of that fight i do um and what a night from juan archuleta B between the entrance and the costume that he was rocking and the dance on on his way in which they said was uh an, an aztec warrior type costume and in, in an homage to his uh, mother's lineage uh, between that the win, the awesome fight he put on the post fight speech um, where he's imitating Lenny Hart I mean that he'll be he'll be telling stories about this one when he's like 80 so that was a hell of a <laughs> night for him and then on the flip you have Su Chul Kim how cool is this guy as a fighter I mean I, I've, I've I don't know that I've ever watched like a full fight of his I remember when he was the the double champ in road and I saw some clips but to watch a a full fight of his I could watch this guy fight all day I, I love to see guys with unique styles like that like that's the part of MMA that used to be so appealing to me that we've kind of lost because now everyone for the most part is kind of born from like an MMA mold so you don't see guys with these like weirder styles like he has and to see a throwback style like his is just awesome and he came to scrap like they scrapped right out of the gate i do think juan probably won round one but everything kim was throwing hurt including the leg kicks like he was coming with heat and juan was in a bit of trouble on the feet in this fight man like kim was just walking him down and he was changing his angles really well beautiful shots to the body sometimes lead uppercuts to the body which was unique to see but they were landing and and Juan had to rely on the wrestling like he he had to use that to get him through or else he was kind of getting walked down um but I, I think he did I like I said I think he took round one round two he was able to get a bunch of takedowns I think he did enough to take round two as well so I do think the right guy won on the cards uh I do think him won round three so it was a really good scrap. It was no easy fight for either guy, um, and, and a good a good win for for Juan, but a, a good showing for both of them. 
for sure. And, and then Juan had me dying with, with the impressions of Lenny Hart on the mic in, in the post fight. That guy was just freaking living his life out there. He, he didn't care who was watching or who was listening. Yeah. <laughs> Archuleta was a 15 year old adolescent in that cage for those like three minutes in his post fight interview. He was so yes. happy. 100%. So happy. Yeah, man. Okay, one more before we get into our MMA Sphere Headlines segment. Opening the main card for Bellator versus Ryzen in Japan on New Year's Eve. Godzi Rabana ah, I always trip on my tongue. Rabadanov. Rab how do you say it? Yep, you got it. You had it. Rabadanov. Rabadanov defeated Koji Takeda by unanimous decision in a three round lightweight bout. Omar, let me stick with you again. What's your take? Uh, a very good fight. Uh, Rabadonov, I thought, actually put the beats on Takeda. Um, sure did. First round was rough for Takeda. Uh, I think he dropped Takeda at least once, if not twice. Um, definitely cracked him a few times. His head went back more than once in that fight, even though he didn't drop that many times. Um, but a hell of a performance in the first round. Once you started getting further into the fight, you could see that he was picking up the pace. Uh, Rabadonov, I should say, was picking up the pace. It was just getting worse for Takeda. Um, and this was just another one of these Team Khabib winners uh, that just put the beats on him, man. It was a great performance yeah, man. from Rabadonov. So impressive. Mark, give us your take. Rabadonov nearly finishing Takeda. What's your take? Bro, nearly finishing is right. Takeda got dropped so bad in round one. I don't know. He just fucking popped up. Like, I, he got dropped so bad. I don't know how he was back on his feet so quickly. That was a wild one. But he was a tough dude, man, and he showed it all fight yeah. long. Because, obviously, round one went uh, Godzi's way. But round two, Rob Donoff kind of let Takeda back in. He took his foot off the gas. Takeda started finding some success, mixing it up. And we knew he Takeda had some wrestling in his bag. He, he's a well-rounded fighter as well. I, and I thought he came back and took round two and made Godzi have to say, like, fuck, I got to make sure I get round three here. And round three was was competitive, but I do think Godzi got it. I think I think the right guy won the decision and all. But uh, I really enjoyed this fight. I was impressed by Takeda. He was a tough dude. He was trying to figure out the puzzle. I thought they were, they were pretty evenly matched. Uh, they had some great grappling exchanges, great scrambles. You could tell that both guys were not really able to implement the game plan they had hoped that they would. They, they were nullifying each other a lot in there. So it was a really well-matched fight, and I enjoyed it. But Godzi did manage to tough it out and get the W. So he uh, continues to make his name and obviously gets a big a big spotlight on him in this one. Yeah, man. When he dropped him with that one-two and then the knee to the face on the way up, oh, I could not believe that he survived that. Yeah, the knee didn't even face you know, him. There were, there were so many times where I – I like. You know, us being UFC boys and whatever else, like, we're so used to the rule set. Yes. There were so many yes. times this this event where so somebody did like, something crazy. Oh. And, I'm, and I'm standing there, that's fucking illegal, man. It just, it's, it's not. It's I had not. wrapped my head totally around legal. that it was legal, so I wasn't freaking out about that. But I still hadn't wrapped my head around, like, to not be shocked when it happened. Yes. Like, every kick, I was like, oh! <laughs> like, I remember when AJ... At one point, AJ goes for a, for a soccer kick on the ground or, the, or a, yeah. a stomp on the ground while uh, Kleber was on the ground. And I was like, dude, dude what are you a, doing? A, or D'Souza, excuse nasty, me, D'Souza. Yeah, he had one nasty stomp, like, to the body. It, yeah, it was a, yeah. It was a dope one. Yeah. It, he had some good ones. It, those, those moments were freaking me out, though, because I'm, I'm not used to seeing that stuff now at this point. Yeah, that yeah. now that when it's happening in a rule set that it's allowed, it just – keeps throwing me by surprise i can't get used to it i love it but i can't get used to it yeah it would be like watching an nba game and seeing somebody like take eight steps to a layup and you're like oh my god <laughs> and then you're like oh but it, that's allowed in, in this league although like in the nba in the nba that's like going to be in another yeah, 10 years that's what guys there. are going to do we're nearly, we're nearly there dude shogun <laughs> after he takes this last fight coming up in brazil in what is it in january right this coming month he should sign for one fight in Ryzen, soccer kick someone's face off, and then retire. <laughs> that would yeah. be awesome. Somebody call, Shogun, somebody call Shogun from Ryzen, and somebody call Machida, and let's make that happen. Machida we'll versus Shogun. 
rising I to make, one I fight. I want to make some bum just so we can see one more soccer kick from Shogun. I don't know if he's soccer kicking Machida. You just don't want to see. But... He might be. Machida is not the Machida of old. Yeah, neither Shogun. Machida very well might be getting laid out by a soccer kick. Uh, Kyoji, I don't think, I don't know if it was Kyoji who landed a knee from the ground. Like, so he, I think he might have been Kyoji who landed it. He knocked down, um, I forget this boy's name already. Oji Kubo. Yes. It was and, nice. it was nice. and immediately goes for a knee. Like, I, it, dude, I was like, what are you doing? Don't do it. And then again, I got there. I got there. Yes. Okay. That does it. Uh, congrats to Bellator for uh, sweeping Ryzen and all five bouts on this very cool crossover end of year card Bellator MMA versus Ryzen FF. Uh, you know what? I thought about it. If I was the Ryzen CEO, do you, do you think he's upset that he got swept? Not at all, man. I don't, I don't think so. Dude, first of all, how many people really gave a shit about Ryzen? From from a casual standpoint, right? Even if you watched UFC for you know a little bit here and there, you watch some of the bigger guys in the Bellator when when it you know shows up on your TV or whatever. I doubt any one of them have probably even turned on a Ryzen event. You can't tell me that their fighters didn't get more exposure in this event than they probably ever have since they've started the organization on a mainstream level, not just an MMA. I'm a fan of MMA. I watch MMA, but from a, a regular Saturday night kind of sports purpose yeah. you know bellator and showtime i think really put ryzen on the map with that one not to mention ryzen didn't really get run over they put on some fucking competitive matches yeah um, even the kyoji right. horiguchi one yeah even the kyoji horiguchi one who we again arguably was the the most dominant performance of the five that was still a hard fought fight you yeah, know what i mean like I all of those guys but it was it was still hard fought. It, you know what I mean? It wasn't. Yeah. We've seen real people get it's a run shame over. They before. didn't have Kyoji on their side, so they could have at least got a W. Considering he, is I originally I thought he was for Ryzen, and then once I saw the layout, I saw what was going on. But but I just figured that was what it was. But I, I had the same thought. Either way, man, I thought the Rising guys showed up and and, and really uh, really did their thing. They didn't win, but you can't tell me that they didn't fight their asses off. I thought it was fantastic performances from all of them. The event itself was fucking awesome. I honestly haven't had that much fun as an event whole, especially from a Bellator production, first of all, because I've said it before, I don't like Bellator productions. I don't I don't really bang yeah, with agree. how they do things over there. Uh, but this one, tits. I loved it. Yeah, I was I was going to make a similar point. I was going to say it's I'm sure it's twofold. Like I'm sure he is upset. He in his mind, I bet he didn't think they'd go 0 and 5. I'm sure he thought they'd at least get a couple of them. He probably had faith in his own fighters. But because of the way they fought, as Omar said, I think he feels all right about it. Because, every, you know, say what you want about how close the Kyoji fight was. The others, a lot of people's eyes were open to how good D'Souza is after yeah. how competitive of a fight he had with AJ McKee, people who may not have known him. And then all three of the other dudes, Kleber, um, Takeda, and Sucho Kim, freaking went to war out, out there with, with with studs so i i think all three of those guys anyone who was watching is now interested in those three guys because they yes. see the kind of fight they can put on and next time they're on they're like let me beat these guys so i think overall it was a win and then i i also think omar made a great point about the event because if you're going to put on events like that that make people you know the older fan i'm calling myself older granted I wasn't even true Pride era. I went back and watched Pride. There's fans older than us yeah, yeah. who yeah. are true Pride era. <clears throat> but um, who are, who are going to get those Pride vibes? If you're going to put on events like that, if you're going to do it every New Year's or maybe even t twice a year, things like that, and people know that's happening now, you're going to get eyes. Yeah, man. I just want to yeah, point absolutely. out, this is, this is why the UFC won't do this. Because imagine, and just for an argument's sake, imagine the UFC goes 0-5. The same way we're talking about Ryzen getting something out of still going 0-5, the UFC loses and loses hard if that were to happen to them. There's no, like these guys got, as far as I'm concerned, Ryzen and Bellator got a win-win out of this event. It didn't really matter if the Ryzen fighters won these events, obviously, and at least in my head. Now, had they been like, 
you know, ragdolled all five of them and like didn't show up and they all looked terrible and you know, it was to the point where they didn't even look like they should have been in there with the Bellator guys, then we might have a different conversation. That wasn't even close to the case. Uh, I think so Bellator I think it really would ended have, up would have been would have been bad for them. Even if they lost like three two, I think it would have been potentially bad for them. I think it would have been a definitely a different look for sure. Um but I think it was I, I think it ended up being a win win for both of them. Um but it's 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 one of the reasons if you look at how that event went and the potential of how that event could have gone, this is why the UFC won't ever do it. You'll never see it. Don't hold your breath. Yeah. Yeah. All right, boys, let's uh, spin this thing forward, as John Anik would say, and uh, go to our next segment, Inside the MMA Sphere with Omar Artolo. All right. We have some headlines for you this week. January has started off with shit. So strap in, boys and girls. Let's get into it. Uh, first on the list, just a quick update on the Cain Velasquez trial. Uh, the boy is still out uh, on bail, so we're still good there. He's at home. He has to stay at home. He can't leave his house, GPS monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Wait, now but he can't leave his house? It's been like that. He wasn't allowed to leave his house unless he had court approval. So the, the the wrestling stuff and all that stuff, that was all approved, pre-approved by the court. But he can't just got it, got it, got it. Right, leave okay. his house. Um, the trial for Cain Velasquez has officially been set for March 8th. Uh, so that is when everything will start to go down. We'll start to hear argument. Or they'll probably at that point start to pick the jury, uh, which will probably take, I think, probably a week, maybe a few days. Um, and then they'll kind of get into the, uh, the opening arguments and calling witnesses and yada, yada, yada. I would expect something like that once the once the trial starts, probably a couple months. Um, so I would expect somewhere between March and June to get real interesting with the Cain Velasquez news. So we'll, we'll keep you up to date as those things progress. Next on the list, the biggest news that has come out, well, the most, the biggest, the most interesting for a lot of different reasons, but Dana White in the news uh, at a New Year's Eve party in Mexico, I believe Tijuana, but I could be wrong about that. It was Tijuana? No? Huh. I forgot. Sorry, I was muted. Fucking Mexico. Um, no, no I was, you're good. I was, guessing, I was guessing about Mexico. I don't know where in Mexico it was. Well, Mexico. It wasn't here. It was in Mexico. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. he was at a New Year's Eve party with uh, his wife. Uh, there was a video taken by some creep very far across the way uh, that showed Dana White's wife, showed him and da Dana White and his wife getting into some sort of verbal altercation with each other. Dana White's wife combat. cracking him in the face with a open uh, slap and Dana White immediately cracking her right back in her face with an open slap. Uh, a further scuffle ensues. They get separated, it seems like, from afar. It, does, it gets a little bit blurrier, or a little bit less easy to figure out what is going on uh, after Dana White retaliates with a slap. So won't speculate too much about that. Uh, but what was clear was his wife slapped him and he slapped her right back. Twice. Not a great look. At least once. Like I said, I don't know what happened after. Yeah. Because it, it gets a little, are, it gets a little yeah. muddy. It, you could say yeah, it, it looked like he might have even pushed her. Or, like, I don't know. It was clear, though, that there was slap exchanged a lot of tension there were the yeah two. they were fighting that's enough they're arguing too they're enough. mad at each other he, about who knows what there's and like the moments the moments before she slapped him there was another like bit where you could see him he was like holding both of her hands clearly like they're arguing he's like telling her to probably to not hit him oh, and they were uh arguing. it sucks yeah yeah, yeah. It definitely sucks, but so, you, you you can't you can't hit your wife though, recording or not. You no. you cannot hit your wife. You also just, can't hit can't. your husband. You also can't I, like people can't disagree. hit people. I don't disagree with you, Mike. I don't disagree with you at all. But the the Thank response you. the response yes. yeah is yeah. not yeah. to hit your wife. It's yeah. just not. So, a it was in Cabo. I just looked it up. B I do agree that you can't hit your husband, which everyone always fucking ignores. So, no, I hundred percent. I don't mind you making that point. The reason th – this is going to sound kind, kind of weird. In no way, like, Dana fucked up a million percent, and he should be in trouble, and it seems like he's not going to be. Correct. I think the reason this is not that large of a story 
may solely be because he slaps her from like six inches away. Like, yeah. it's not like yeah. he swings. He kind of just yeah. has his hand near her and whacks her. And I kind of think people are seeing it as much as they shouldn't be doing this and being like, uh, it probably didn't hurt. So, like, we're not going to make a big thing out of it. I really think that's what's happening. So, it, I think it's two no different things that no one cares about this. I think I see it as two different things. One, I see it as a bias of the expectations for people in this sport, for people in this fight I agree business. Totally. If this was like fucking some CEO, like Roger Goodell of the NFL. Holy shit, like, that was my name. Game. That was yeah. the exact name I was going to throw out. If this was Roger Goodell, if this was fucking LeBron Jordan, LeBron, holy shit, sorry. LeBron James, if this was uh, 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 Derek Jeter, or if he was still playing for the, if this was anybody else not involved in a combat sport, this would be front page news. This would be replaying on ESPN like if it was the fucking Christmas parade. This would be this would be everywhere. But the expectations, I think, of the MMA world are different. Which is interesting considering how much shit Dana White has talked about guys who hit women when it's convenient for him. Yes. Right? Because we've seen years ago there was a dude who who had a rumor? I don't even know if it was if it was confirmed. So a rumor that he had a, had a, a, a an incident with his wife, a, a guy who's low level. I think he had one fight in the UFC, low level. Not only did he cut the kid, but he publicly shit on him. Talked about how no man should be hitting his wife and all this other crazy shit. John Jones beats the shit out of his wife. The oh. woman has a bleeding lip. We hear a nine one one call. The whole chabosh. John Jones about to get a heavyweight championship fight with Nganu in like six months. Right? Yeah. Greg Hardy. Greg Hardy had a whole fucking reputation for beating a fucking woman. Yeah. Let's bring this boy in. Not only do we bring him in, we're going to put him on the card with Rachel Osovich, who two weeks prior to that card had been recently involved in a domestic uh, violence dispute with her partner at the time. The, the, the expectations when it comes to domestic violence and violence in general in the MMA community is not the same across the board. Not to mention that as long as Dana White has control, he gets to pick and choose where his, where his morals make sense. Because it's not mm. the same. Because if it was, John Jones would have been at the bottom of a fucking gutter a long time ago. Mm. So, yeah, man. I don't think ESPN is playing it because ESPN obviously has a stake in UFC's reputation. Because, again, if this was somebody else or anything else, they would have been playing it back and forth. They talked about, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, the golf dickhead who cheated on his wife with, like, a thousand women. What's the guy? Tiger Woods? Tiger Woods? SME more. Tiger Woods. They talked about Tiger Woods like this man had murdered people. Murdered yes. people. He cheated on his Swedish wife. Apparently a lot. And let's, <laughs> let, 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 let's be clear. That she's Swedish. Cause he married like some like beautiful like beautiful Scandinavian woman, some like Swedish model, Mike, and it like wasn't enough shit. for this fucking guy. He fucking takes it personally. If you got a hot ass wife and you're cheating on her, you are a fucking asshole. Not <laughs> you're like just you. like that much more of an asshole. Um, but but that's but that's that, that kind of it's my point, right? It's Dana White may not get the repercussions that he should he deserves because of all the bias that goes into it. I think that's number one. Number two. A lot of the fandom of the UFC, frankly, are a lot of nasty ass motherfuckers. Okay. A lot of the people that go hard for UFC tend to be a lot of guys who frankly probably think that Dana White was in the right. That if a woman hits you, you could probably hit her back. That it's okay. There's a lot of people online, both on Twitter and frankly in news outlets that are making a lot of excuses for what Dana White did. You will never see that, or I don't think you would ever see that if it wasn't something of this magnitude in combat sports specifically. Who's been making excuses? So, like names that we know? I haven't seen this. No, they're like, they're media outlets. Um, there are media outlets that were saying uh, that, you know, that he, that she hit him first and that it wasn't, you know, he wasn't necessarily the aggressor and all of this, shit. like just making small comments to sort of 
explain why it was okay for him to do what he did or why they understand why he did what he did or, or whatever, whatever. I don't fucking agree. So I'm not really going to go into why, what their thought process is. Cause it's nonsense. I'm the man hit his wife. This man is lucking out that his hand was six inches from her face and he kind of did like the fly smack. If he was further It'll be away interesting, and, though. and the video looked different, people would be making a bigger deal. It'll be interesting to see if there is going to be any fallout. Right now, I think we're about two or three days removed since since when it dropped, or maybe even maybe even a day. I don't even know now at this point. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if there is going to be any extended fallout from it. But but to be honest, nobody has been saying shit about something like th- about this that should be everywhere, literally everywhere. But well, we're saying something about it. Goddamn right. Goddamn I mean, right. it sucks, dude. It sucks. I'll tell you something. Here, here's my take. I am I I don't like absolutes. And like clearly, like if we're also this is a, a very different thought. Let me just like give myself my own, like side note here. I think we're in a very interesting, like transitional period in like human society. Go with me here. Jeez, we be careful. We're at uh, yeah sure sure, we're we're at like a kind of a crossroads between like women's equality and like an old school kind of a chauvinistic kind of a thing, where we want women to be equal in all in all ways in all situations, but then we also say things like a man should never put his hands on a woman. I don't know about you. Like if a woman who is bigger than me, I'm about 170 pounds. If a woman was like a 200 pound woman and was like attacking me, would I be like, I'm not, I'm not going to put my hands on this woman. I w- might defend myself. It's not your wife, dude. I, but here's, here's the other thing too, though. If, if you, there is a difference between retaliating out of pride and retaliating out of safety. Dana White was sure. not in fear of his life. Dana sure. White was in no way going to get hurt. His pride would have probably been completely sliced in half, potentially, oh, yeah. had he that, not retaliated. That response was a you're embarrassing me in the club right now response. Yeah. I think his slap to her was kind of like a – it was basically like a fuck you slap. Like, well, fuck, yeah. well, fuck you. Like, she slapped him, and then he's like, well, fuck you right back. And he was like, I, look, I could slap you too. I, I, and, I he should have. A, and he shouldn't have. And he shouldn't have. I agree. I took it more of a, a bitch. Who do you think you are? Slap. That was what I saw it. As. Maybe, maybe. Um, but but like again, me, like. yeah. it, it just either way though, man. Like the that's the other thing I actually have heard is the the equality uh, argument. Not to say that that's what you've said, but the equality argument has been going around about you know if women want to hit men, then men can hit women back. That's not it. That's not it. At I don't all. think people should hit anybody in public. You shouldn't hit in I, public or private. If you're not getting paid to hit somebody in the cage, you shouldn't be hitting anybody ever. There are, I think there are situations where you yeah, should be able to hit people, but there are, but they are far and few between. You definitely don't hit somebody that is not a threat to you though. That's, that's my biggest thing. If that person is not an actual threat to your totally. safety and only to your pride, you should not be hitting that person back. Suck that shit up. Get the fuck out of there. Leave if you need to. Call him yeah. an asshole. Call him a bitch. Call him a cunt. Call him whatever you got to. Get the fuck out of there and don't put your hands sure. on him. That's and if you're, now, if you're the man and, you, and you're 50 pounds heavier than your wife, you should be like what, like, what the fuck are you doing? I mean, look, it's easy for us to say this now. He was probably drunk. She was probably drunk. They were both under the influence at a loud, dark, crowded club. Not that any of that is an excuse, but it just, it's easy to say that with our right minds sitting here in our homes – Dude, That's to all. Flip, to flip this to the other, I've said too much. I, I've you've given me enough rope to hang myself. So there you go. <laughs> to, to flip this to the other perspective, if I was talking to a couple who was eighty years old and they've been married for whatever you want to say, sixty years, and they're like, you know, in eighty years of marriage, we've never had any issue. We never got physical with each other, other than one New Year's Eve, we were drunk in Cabo in a bar and we both smacked each other. Can't believe we did it, but. You know, we talked about it. It never happened again. I'd be like, yeah, cool. I get that shit happens in six years of marriage. You know what I mean? Like there's shit happens in relationships. So like 
I don't want to make it sound like we need to crucify people. But at the same time, you can't be hitting women. And it's t- a terrible look from Dana White. I, I, I don't know, man. I can't see myself <clears throat> in the next 60 years married to my wife putting legitimate hands on her. Especially sure. now that we legitimately put hands on each other, like, <laughs> consent. That's the, so, that's the key, man. That's the key. So I, I don't, I don't know, man. I, I, it, that, that one's hard for me to, to wrap my head around. Um, I don't, I've, I've been fucking drunk before. I have been so drunk that I don't feel my legs. I've been super drunk. I have never, <laughs> never gotten so fucking drunk that I've needed to hit somebody. Never. It's, it's never happened. And the people that use that shit as an excuse. And I think that the, the one of no, the, you're right. It's not. It's not an excuse to me. I, I, what is that? That, that? that saying that like drunk actions are sober thoughts. It just it says yeah. a lot of things, man. It says a lot of things. And again, you know, we could talk about in forty years what looking back at this day looked like, and maybe it's not a big deal in forty years because of all the actions that have gone up to it. Dana White maybe never. But we don't know what happened. We don't know if this has ever happened. Dana well, White's wife is saying mean, that it's then. never happened. Right. So for, for all we know, they have the greatest relationship ever. And they had one terrible night where they both can't believe it happened. And they both already have forgiven each other. And it's never going to happen again. For all we know. You know what I mean? So right. I don't want to judge other people's relationships. I'm not trying to say that this was not fucked up and a problem. I'm just trying to discuss the whole angle of everything. Yeah. My litmus test has always been if, some, if, the woman, if, if there's a woman who is trying to attack me for some reason... Short of this woman having a weapon on her of some kind, I, I'm probably not gonna like hit somebody. I'm just not. Knife? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you might get a foot yeah. to the face. All bets are off. Knife All bets are off. I mean, All yeah, bets, yeah, yeah. I don't care if you're a uh, yeah. All right, we gotta move uh, past this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, this week is just a, just this week. Fuck you, Dana White. You know, we'll evaluate next week and see where we're at. Uh, next on the list, it gets darker. Uh, another Mexico story, oh. former UFC fighter, Phil Baroni. For those of you who don't know who Phil Baroni is, he hasn't been in the UFC for quite some time. One of the, one of the more OG guys of the golden era, uh, of the UFC, uh, kind of the mid, uh, mid two thousands, kind of the two thousand mid two thousands into the early 2010s. Uh, that might even be too late, <clears throat> but anyway. That was Phil Baroni's era. Uh, decent fighter, definitely not championship quality. Fun guy, fun personality. Um, definitely a name you would remember had you been watching around those those years. Phil Baroni was arrested in Mexico for the murder of his girlfriend. Fucking hell. There's yeah. a lot of speculation as to what happened. There are, there are not, unfortunately, a lot of details... Uh, that have been provided. Uh, there was a statement by Josh Barnett, who has known Phil Baroni for a long time, who has spent a lot of time with Phil Baroni. Um, long story short, he kind of equated the whole situation to CTE, and that CETE had been plaguing Phil Baroni or has been plaguing Phil Baroni for quite some time. Um, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't surprise me at this point if that is something that comes out in light of the the investigation that's going on uh, as a result of the murder. Um, Because Phil Baroni got into a lot of wars. And like I said, he wasn't the greatest fighter, so there wasn't a ton of uh, of defense. And, you know, the golden era was kind of notorious for having a lot of amazing scraps and back and forth fights because, you know, the technique wasn't as polished, I think, in the defensive areas as they are now. Um so there were tons of bangers back in the day, tons of sloppy bangers and, and, and guys getting laid out left and right and all that kind of stuff. But um, sad story. You know, I, I wasn't like a huge Phil Baroni fan, but this is not something you want to read about anybody ever. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if the man needs help or if he needs to be in jail. I, I don't know. I don't know, man. It sucks I mean, all the way around. I would think he needs to be in jail. Well, but, uh... I'm just saying like he has a condition like – you know, yeah, I'm sorry. There's, yeah, there's, there's two sides of it. It just, it sucks all the way around. You know, it just. No, I um, I mean, he was a fun character in yeah. MMA. You know, he was the New York badass. He, he said funny things. He was a cocky guy. He had the New York Italian accent. Like, 
you know, he was enjoyable in his time in MMA. So to, to see that headline the other day sucked. And like you, I've actually seen a, a good handful of people tweeting that they have known Phil Baroni in whatever capacity and that they have felt there have been signs of CTE for a while. So yeah. it, it sounds like that may be what's happening. Granted, it, the details of this murder don't seem to be like some premeditated thing where he like lost his right. mind. It seems to be a fight that happened. Um, and I think he like pushed her or she fell or something and she hit her head something. on something and died. Yeah. Yeah. Something, something so, fucked up. Who knows? But I would imagine, I mean, like you said, unless it's some help scenario, but I would imagine Phil Baroni is going to be ending up in jail here because that is a bad one. And then you also got to wonder if he ends up in Mexican jail or if they extradite him back to the U.S. Because if he's in oh, Mexican that's jail, that's think about that. fuck. That's that's so much worse. So yeah. much worse. Um, yeah. So fuck yeah, him. yeah. Fuck Phil Baroni, man. <laughs> yeah, and at the same yeah. time, I kind of, I kind of still want something good as far as his mental health or something. But I don't, I, he might just be yeah. too far gone. I mean, the CT thing is so fucking hard so hard it is i mean we've seen like, guys with cte just completely fucking lose it and this is not the oh, first I mean, person the, that we've seen the, like the, beat the shit out of their families and their wives chris jericho or wasn't chris jericho was no say, sorry the, the the story is what is, is chris benoit every thank you, thank you. Single, oh yeah every single um i can't think of the word i want to say but every single thing that anyone ever had to say about chris benoit was that he was the greatest dude, the greatest friend, greatest husband, greatest dad, everything. Like, literally people's favorite guy they knew. Like, unanimously across the board. And he murdered his entire family. Snapped. So, literally just snapped. It's, it's crazy. You know. It's, CTE it's, it's, is it's, a motherfucker. It, to this man. day, it's, it's one of the worst stories I've ever, yeah. I can ever recall in my life. Um, but yeah, CTE, it, it, it can make you not be you anymore. Like, it's a different guy than it was before the effects took you over. So. It's happened to football players, too. A lot of the older football players that, you know, once they've retired, you kind of see them start to deteriorate at kind of a, a messed up rate. Um, their personalities change. Their aggressions change. It's it's almost like being on roids without being on roids. It's yeah. as far as the, the, the attitude is concerned. So... My heart goes out to Baroni, if we're being honest, man. I, I feel bad for the kid that he's even in this position as a result of the CTE. Um, murdering girlfriend, obviously not. Huh. I'm not condoning that. That's that's super fucked up. Um, definitely needs to have some repercussions for it, but it just sucks that we're even that we're even here for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Dark episode yeah. tonight. Yeah. <gasps> yep. Are, are we yep. doing awards? Yeah. <laughs> it's possible. Hopefully those are a little bit more lighthearted. Um, it, it gets better from here. So those were our two sh shit back stories for the night. Uh, next on the list, Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao made his little uh, debut in Risen, uh, proclaiming that he has signed with Ryzen or Riz Ryzen. Ryzen. Did I say Risen? Ryzen. Yeah. Ryzen has not Risen. Uh, he signed Ryzen for boxing. Currently, it is a one fight contract, but. It is not going to be the last time, quote unquote, for Manny Pacquiao. Uh, so he expects to make his debut in 2023 and not n not a non-interesting event to have happened. A uh, very interesting signing from Ryzen and, and very interested to see what happens. Um, next on the list, I don't, I generally don't put Dylan Dennis in my shit unless it's, unless it's funny. Um, and I put oh, him in is... there when we were talking about Ariel Hawani having like, flamed this kid for like an hour and 15 minutes uh and he called out dylan and was like you know this isn't going to happen this fight with you and ksi is not going to happen i'm going to put this fight not happening at minus nine thousand. it is minus nine thousand that you will fight ksi dylan danis has officially pulled out of the ksi fight with 10 days to go quote unquote he is unprepared <sighs> That's cool. So Dylan that Dennis quote, is that, that quote is from KSI's manager. So I'm not. It was from KSI's. Manager. I don't know if I believe yeah. that's what Dylan actually said, but yeah. I'm not. I wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me. 
the kid didn't necessarily look yeah. like he was in the best shape when he was on the Ariel Hawani show, no, if we're being didn't. honest. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that didn't, he didn't look like he was making any kind of weight for fights. Um, so I'm not surprised. Uh, Dylan Dennis is probably at this point the biggest weenus out of this entire <laughs> Uh And I don't really know what he's, I mean, I've never seen a chooch of this level. I mean, he's... Yeah, man. He's, really? He's on some next level shit right now. Next level. You can I say mean, what you I want about like... Patty Pimblett, but Patty Pimblett shows up to fight. <laughs> At does. least Patty Pimblett shows up. I mean, this shit and is he... crazy. Dude, I feel also like we are rewarding Dylan Dennis by talking about this. Like, this I, is I'm what aware. he wants. He wants to be in the news cycle. Yeah. And, 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 and that's why I, I tend to... And you can go back and there's, a, there's been a lot more of him in the news for dumber shit. But anytime that he gives me an opportunity to shit on him with some validity, I'm probably going to take it. So, so there's that. Dylan Dennis is a chooch again, pulls out of a fight 10 days notice. KSI got replaced, or uh, KSI replaced him with some other YouTuber, and the fight becomes even more relevant than what it was to begin with. So there that is. Uh, next on the list, Mike Perry apparently has signed to fight Jake Paul. I don't hate this. I, I don't hate this at all. Has he really? Mike oh, my Perry, God. Mike Perry actually doesn't have the best boxing, and I think his boxing's probably gotten even worse since he's been doing BKFC. Um, so I think Jake Paul might actually have a real, real shot of beating Mike Perry here. So there's that. So we'll there, see. there has been no confirmation that he's actually fighting Jake Paul. He I thought Mike Perry said image, it himself. He shared an image of a contract that he said was a contract to fight Jake Paul. But there has been no word from Jake Paul's side. There has been no word from media that this is a real thing. All we have is a post from Mike Perry. So it may be real, but it could also be Mike Perry doing Mike Perry things. All right. Well, hopefully Mike Perry is not just a borderline fucking lying sociopath. So let's just hope that's what's not happening. And he said uh, that but, he said that he said that he signed a contract to fight Jake, but Jake changed his mind. That was the tweet with the picture of the contract. So even he is making it sound like it's not actually happening. So who knows? Right, well, fucking Mike Perry then just put up the most pointless tweet. I mis I misunderstood what that was. I thought that was him saying that he was that he had signed that he was going to fight Jake Paul. No. But, all right. Well, Mike Perry is also a chooch then. Uh, next on the list, Damir Ismagulov officially retires from MMA due to undisclosed medical issues. Uh, it sounds like he either found something out after the fight about something medical related, um, and it really took him out. And he said that as a result, he's, he's done. He can't continue to compete anymore. So that really that sucks. sucks. Um, sucks a lot. Yeah. He won it. He was, fucking, he was good. Obviously he was very, very good. Oh, for sure. Um, that was his first loss All in right. ages. Yeah. All right. Let's get into these handful of fight announcements, and then we will jump into our award show. Uh, first on the list, we have Jack De La Maddalena versus Randy Brown. That has been added to the UFC's 284 event on February 11th. Uh, Derek Brunson versus Drikus Duplessis has been added to UFC's 285 event on March 4th. Along with that, uh, Jeff Neal versus Shavkat, uh, Shavkat Rachmanov has been uh, re rebooked for the March 4th event, UFC 285. Rafael Asuncao versus Kyler the Matrix Phillips has been added to UFC's March 11th event. This is a fantastic fight. Somebody tried to get into an argument with me that Kyler Phillips was not an up-and-comer. I don't know what fucking drugs that person is on. Kyler Phillips is absolutely an up-and-comer. I gave him examples, specific examples about the number of fights he's been in total, the number of fights he's been in the UFC, the number, the number of names that he's fought in the UFC, which is like one, maybe two. And the kid's like, he's, he's been fighting since 2011. He's not an up-and-comer. All right, cool. Or 2013 or whatever. Whatever it was, it was a stupid fucking argument. Either way. Kyler Phillips is an up-and-comer, a fantastic one, and I'm excited to see these up-and-comers get real spots because that seems to be what's happening. Yeah. So, amen. I mean, most people don't uh, even know who Kyler Phillips is at this point. Um, uh, and also, that's four bangers that you just read off. Oh, it gets better. It gets better. Daniel Pineda versus Tucker Lutz has been added to UFC San Antonio card on March 25th. But, but 
but your boys, piece de resistance, the shit that I was here to tell everybody, the news that you all need to know is Rob Font versus your boys number one, Adrian motherfucking Yanez in the works for April 8th. Yeah, I think that was a cat. Love it. Uh, UFC's April 8th event. Let's go. Huge spot for Yanez. Yanez is about to break some rec or about to break some uh some ladder movement up in those rankings. I'm fucking I'm hyped for that one. Yeah. That's that's it how it makes me end. it makes me really fucking nervous, to be honest. This man in the UFC has fought Victor Rodriguez, who is nothing, Gustavo Lopez, who is okay, Randy Costa, <laughs> who's, okay. who's okay. Davey Grant, who is like a solid vet. That's the best person he has fought. And Tony Kelly, who is all right. And they are going straight to Rob Font. Like, the the difference in opposition that Adrian Yanez is going to have to adjust to from what he has seen so far is quite stark. And I hope that they didn't do this I hope they didn't fuck this up by skipping a step or two. And I hope he's ready. Stylistic, stylistically, I think this is a bad fight for Rob Font, ever being 100% honest. I think Yanez is a bad stylistic matchup for Rob Font. I think his forward pressure, his, his actual power shots, I think he'll be able to deal with the volume because his footwork, I think, is just as good as Rob Font's. Um, I, the style I think, helps. I, think he, I, I agree. The style helps. I think he's going to mess up Font, man. I think this is going to be the one to put Giannis on the on the map, and I'm ready for yeah. it. I mean, fuck, when the day comes, I'm probably going to pick him. I just, I'm shocked at how how high they went for this opponent, but hey, we'll see. That's all we have for you boys this week. Okay. All right. Well, we have no fights to uh, preview for you folks this week. Instead, we are going to first look back at our predictions for how this year would have gone or would might have gone wow that was shitty <laughs> and we're going to do our awards for this year so with a little sip of my bardstown bourbon look at you we got to be sponsored dude this stuff shout, is so good shout them out on the air bardstown on the every air. sip like we're on the fucking radio we're live <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, let's see. Looking back, so, uh, about a year ago, we predict we put out our predictions for Breakout Star. Uh, who wants to go first? What, how do you want to do this? Yeah, we could each take our own, I guess. So, I could start if you want. I, last year when we did this, I had kind of done stars for like a lot of different weight classes. I guess we... We were not on the same page. The, these guys came with a more condensed <laughs> list than myself, which is shocking. What else is new? I always have too many people on my list. <laughs> and I'll probably have too, too many honorable mentions when we do the award show in a few minutes. But uh, <laughs> I did pretty well, if we're being honest. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of went by weight class. So, yeah, we can look back here. Let's ho hold ourselves accountable. Um, heavyweight, I went Tom Aspinall, which I think I was on a great pace for. You were. You were. I still believe he would have beat Curtis Blades, but I got fucked by an injury. Light heavyweight, I kind of went a little different angle in terms of breakout. I just meant that he would break out and be the champ, and he was. I said Yuri Prohaska, so I nailed that one. Uh, middleweight, I said Alex Pereira. Obviously, he is the champ. I said Andre Muniz. He didn't do much this year. What did Andre Muniz fight this year? Like one time? I think once, I like yeah. He barely fought. Now I got to look. Andre Muniz fought one time. Yeah, he beat Uriah Hall. So a quiet year for Muniz, but he did win. So, hey, if he fought a little more, maybe I could You said uh, Joel Alvarez. Well, I didn't get well. to that division yet. I'm on oh, my bad. Weight. <laughs> my uh, bad. Welterweight, I said Ian Gary. I thought maybe we would have taken some more steps. He hasn't lost either, but been a little bit of a, of a slower going. Uh, lightweight, I said Joel Alvarez, who did get turned back. I still believe Joel Alvarez is a really interesting dude, but he, he got turned back pretty badly in his rise by Armin Sarukian. Um, he fights again soon, so we'll see. And I said Patty, who, you know, 
he's yeah. he's doing his thing. Featherweight controversially so. Yeah, lately. Um, featherweight, I skipped. I didn't see anyone I wanted to really call out there as a breakout. Bantamweight, I said Rafion Stotts. My man is the Bellator, well, Bellator interim champion right now. Sergio is still the champion. Uh, and I said Adrian Yanez, who, again, another one of these guys. He did get a win, but it was kind of a quiet year. He didn't quite fight that often. So we'll see now, obviously, as we just mentioned a moment ago, what happens. Um, flyweight, same deal. I said Manel Cop. He only fought once, but it was a win and a big win. So he keeps going. Uh, the one that I really got wrong was Kayla Harrison for women's featherweight. Yeah, we all did. We I, all did with I, that yeah. one. I thought she would sign with the UFC, and I thought she could beat Amanda, and that's why I went with that kind of as a bold pick. Obviously, she didn't come to the UFC, and not only that, she didn't even she win in the PFL. So <laughs> that, was, that was the one I got wrong uh, for sure. I skipped women's bantamweight. I didn't see anyone there, and I didn't do women's strawweight either, but at women's flyweight, I said Tatiana Suarez, who – was supposed to come back early this year. She never did. Now she's supposed to come back early 2023. So I'll probably pick her again for next week when we do these. Um, I mentioned Manon Fior, who obviously is is maybe getting a title shot here, and Aaron Blanchfield, who's looking pretty damn good. So overall, I am I am pretty pleased with my predictions. I, I think I did I did pretty solid, other than the uh, the Kayla choice there. Yeah, man. Uh, let's see. I said. Uh, I thought we were picking basically like the breakout star of the year yeah. uh, last year. Uh, I said Fiziev, uh Rafael Fiziev, and like I honorable honorably mentioned Hamzat. I think I was more right about Hamzat. Obviously, I think we well we all knew, uh, you know, where his star was was going, and that was up to the stratosphere, and it has. The guy's become a bigger and bigger star every time his face is is on a screen. Uh, Fazeev, maybe not so much. I mean, he's, has I mean, looked he's, great. He's another one of these guys that just, he only fought once. He won. <clears throat> yeah. And then he called out a tennis player after he won. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the strangest call out ever. Yeah. who do he call out? What's the guy's name? Raphael, what? Nadal. 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 It's very he was like, let's see back. who's the best Raphael. It's so strange. It's weird to look back at so many of these guys. And be like, why did they only fight one time? And you have to like try to remember, like, were they hurt? Did something happen? Like, fighting one time in a year is so disappointing. It is. It is. Especially Omar if you're Warriors. A bank account. How the fuck are you living yeah. fighting one time a year? Yeah. Uh -huh. Seems seems crazy to me. Um, but we find out later on a lot of these guys end up having nine to five jobs half the time anyway. So. Yeah. Uh, so for my picks, uh, I also went with. Uh, guys who I thought were going to break out. I didn't do it by, by weight class. Um, but the one that I, that I picked was Adrian Yanez. Um, and then I had Patty Pimblett and Hamzat as well. Um, Adrian Yanez was definitely my number one, but like Mark said, he only fought once fought well, knocked the kid out. Definitely with all the, the chirping that was going on in that fight, it was definitely one with, with some cherries on top for sure, but can't really yeah. do too much with one fight one in the year so your boy didn't do too well and of course this all raises the question of like what does it mean to break out as a star it's kind of it's, it's not kind of it's very subjective agreed like you you could argue that patty kind of came in a star yep uh all right omar you had one other one that you honestly kind of nailed um you said sean o'malley and you said that it would, oh. You knew he was already a star, but it would be in a way that legitimizes how good he is. And that's literally <clears throat> what he did. It's true. I Man, I got to say, man, I, I've really loved Sean O'Malley in this last year. And I know a lot of people gave him shit, um, you know, for for the last two performances. And, and, I, and I hate that they do, because if this was a kid that didn't talk as much, that didn't give, that maybe didn't rub people a certain way, uh, all of the things that kind of come with the Sean O'Malley package that people may not like, if they just watched the fight, you can't tell me that that wasn't a competitive fight with Jan. And you yep. can't tell me that Jan 100% won that fight. There's no other way that could have gone and this, that. That's bullshit. You don't like Sean O'Malley, so you thought Jan won a competitive fight. I get that. That's fine. But don't gaslight everybody, bro. And Sean O'Malley did O'Malley work. a bum 
because you didn't like the decision. So now O'Malley's a bum. He's not good. Correct. He <laughs> he fought a competitive fight against Peter Yan, a fucking former world champion, but he's a bum. Sure. It, it, people it, are just wild to me, man. But, you know, regardless of how you feel about Sean O'Malley, personally, the kid is put in work. And he is in the spot I think he deserves to be in. Okay. Uh, and now let's quickly look back on our predictions for who would be the champion of each weight class by the end of the year. Uh, how bad is this list, though? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Starting with women's straw weight, we all, uh, at the beginning of the, of the year, it was Rose, and we all said Rose would, would be the champ. Yeah. So there you have and it. And then she went on to have one of the worst fights in yeah. MMA history. I mean, to our credit, like, she barely lost it. She lost it just by doing nothing. Like, so. I know. Like, someone that blew was her away that we, that we missed calling, you know? Yeah. I wish it didn't feel like a, That fight just didn't feel like a championship fight, though. A draw. Like, it it just, didn't. I wish it could have just been a draw. Yeah. Meh. Okay, women's flyweight. Valentina was the champion at the time, and we all said by the end of the year it would still be Valentina, and we were all right. And also, I noted that I'm ready. This, I'm putting this down now because Mark said on well, last year's show when I rewatched it, Mark said it will be Valentina, and mark it down for the year after it will be Valentina. <laughs> You're probably right. Uh, okay, women's bantam weight. At the beginning of the year, it was uh, Pena. Mark and myself both said that Nunez would get it back. And Omar said it would be Holly Holm. Yeah, I don't know yeah. why, but you that might have been one of those. One. Yeah, that might have just been one of those. I just want to be different picks. <laughs> Your take was that you thought Pena could beat Nunez again and that Holm would then get a shot and that she matched up really well with Pena. And you said even if that wasn't the case, you thought Pena exposed some ways for Holm to beat Nunez if, if that had to be the fight as well. But, yeah, you, you definitely voiced that it was your bold pick. Okay. okay. Let's, Probably let's the, give credit uh, to Mark for rewatching yes. last year's episode because I fucking don't remember that at I all. I watched just a bit of it to note what Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Okay, probably – that one. Let's go, baby. Probably the funniest one was women's featherweight <laughs> – Okay, uh, <laughs> it was all over the map, man. Uh, Mark said, "Kayla, if Kayla signs with the UFC, he thinks he thought Kayla would beat Nunez or Pena or whoever." Uh, I said that the that the division was going to get disbanded, and Omar's response was, "LOL." <laughs> In all fairness, I think mine was the closest to being right. <laughs> Just saying. Did you guys ever even fight? No, right? LOL. No. Well, no. Yeah, it never happened. <laughs> nope. <laughs> LOL. Yeah, literally nothing. And there, were, there were some women's featherweight bouts, but not right. a title fight. Right. It was right. the one Lita Landsberg fight? Oh, God. I think, uh, yeah. Okay, moving over now to the men's side, starting down in flyweight. Uh, the champ was Moreno, I believe. And Mark and Omar both said it would still be Moreno, and I said it would be Figgy. Yeah, yeah you well, got that The one. decision was bullshit, Thank so Thank I still think I'm right. One. We'll see soon enough, though, if Moreno Goddamn gets Goddamn right. Back. Okay, Justice bantamweight. Marino. Bantamweight. At the time of that episode, Aljo had defeated or had gotten the title by DQ when Piotr Jan illegally need him when he was down. Uh, Mark and myself both said that Jan would get it back. And Omar said it would be Jose Aldo by the end of the year. Yeah. Let's say we were all wrong. If it wasn't for TJ Dillashaw. It wasn't for fucking TJ. Yeah, man. Jose would have taken it from Aljo. I stand by it. <laughs> yep. Okay, yeah. featherweight. We featherweight. All that one wrong, man. Props to Aljo. Shut us mm -hmm. all up. I feel Feather like weight. I said Aljo would win that fight. I, I wonder if Aldo was the same thought process I had for home. Well, Aljo wins the rematch, and then Aldo gets a shot at Aljo, and then Aldo wins against Aljo. I didn't watch what you said there, so I can't, I can't help you. 
Okay. Or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe it was Jan that won, and then Aldo fights Jan. No, it couldn't be that one. It had to be the other way around. It had to be the other way around. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, don't know. men's yeah. featherweight. We were all wrong at the, at the beginning of the year. It was Volk. Mark and myself both said that Max would get it back from Volk and finally get over Volk. And Omar said it would be Giga by the end of the year. And the Another greatness bold, of Volkanovski made us all look bad. How dumb yeah. is that one? Yeah. That looking back? Like, I read That's it, okay. I'm like, wait. You didn't pick Volk? Like, it's like, not even one, one of, of us. Not yeah. one not of us picked Volk. Yeah. Like, it almost feels fucking rude that we didn't pick Volk. Yeah. It does. It, it seems does. crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Okay, okay. Lightweight. Now, who was the champion at the time that it was recorded? I forget who. That's great. Charles. Great. It was already was Charles? It Charles? Yes, it was. It yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Charles, yeah. Because uh, Charles defeated Dustin before the new year. Yeah. And let's see, let's see, let's see. Let me get back here. Uh, both uh, myself and Omar said it would be Gaethje by the end of the year, and Mark said it would be Charles still. Yeah. I was closer to being right, but not close <laughs> enough. <laughs> don't, don't Sorry, Dagestan. Yeah. I was say, don't say that. The Mahachevs are going to come for you, bro. Don't hey, say that. Oh, I, was, I was just saying, sorry, Dagestan. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, welterweight, here we go. It was Usman, and we all were unanimous in saying that it would still be Usman. And we were about a minute away from being right. Yep. Yeah. We were. Okay, middleweight. Obviously, it was Adesanya. Both Mark and Omar said that by the end of the year, it would still be Adesanya. And I kind of threw out Sean Strickland, and that felt stupid now. <laughs> <laughs> And it and it arguably could have still been Adesanya. You know? yeah. I was gonna say just like the Usman one, I think we were kind of like a minute and a half away from it being Adesanya again. I think I thought it was four rounds to one up until that. Well, me too. I thought Adesanya had four rounds really. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I think I had him for yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, light heavyweight. We were all unanimous in thinking that by the end of the year it would be Yuri Prohaska. And it was. And it fucking really. should have been. I mean, like that, yeah. we, got that, we got that right. Yes. He say. just blew yes. out his knee. He's not even a new champ yet. Where I, I give us the points on that. Yes. Had Yuri been a dick and just kept the belt, we would have been right. Right. Correct. Okay. And finally, heavyweight. Who was the champ at the beginning of the year? Was it still Nganu? Nganu, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark and Omar both said Nganu, and I said that it would be gone by the end of this year. And it is Nganu. Yeah, well, uh, Nganu did what Yuri didn't do, and he just he held on to the belt. Right. He held yeah, on. I wonder Great what happened was, with the contract was... thing. Wasn't the whole thing that the contract was supposed to expire at the end of the last year or some bullshit, and something was supposed to happen with the money? That's and true. I don't, yeah, I don't know either. I wonder what happens now, because now we are in 2023 officially, and we still haven't heard anything about Nganu. I guess other than the John here. Jones there, stuff. There, there are 12 weight classes, and we got four, four, and three. Correct. Gonna have to do better in 2023. Probably. Okay. Won't. Here we go now. Let us move into our 2022 and new MMA show awards. You gonna put on a bow tie for this? I should have. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I should have put on my tux. Uh, let's start now with the MMA pundit of the year. Mark, would you like to go first? I will go first. This is the layup question. Every single year. I mean, every year. Who else can it be? Close. It's, the, it's the easiest answer, and he certainly sealed it recently with his evisceration of Dylan Dennis. The answer is Ariel Hawani. Omar? Uh, I would have to agree. He even took the time to eviscerate Dana White just a little bit as a result of Dana White slapping his wife. Yes. Uh, Did he? I missed so, that. Yeah, he just, he just posted I, it was, something it was about brutal. it. Oh, it was brutal. <laughs> He's like, now you guys see why... I get so annoyed that a man like that has the audacity to call me a scumbag. Mm. And I was like, that's fair. That is fair. Yeah. Um, among other things. I mean, this was like a 35 minute fucking, you know how Ariel does. Ariel takes his time. Take oh, your insides out. <laughs> the motherfucker's like a vulture. He just sits there and picks at you. He does. Um, but yeah, 
I, I'm a big fan of Hilwani, man. The last couple of years that Hilwani has been a thing has been fantastic. He has been. Yep. I, I like Ariel when he curses. The the Ariel that didn't Me curse too. that went out of his way yep. Yep. to silence and censor himself is not <laughs> it. I enjoy this man that just looks Dylan Dennis in the eye and goes, "Fuck you, <laughs> fuck you, you liar." I love it. I love it. Keep it love up, it. and Ariel Hawani will be pundit of the year until the man is in the ground. Love yes. it. I guess so. For me, it's Ariel again as well, and I completely agree with you, Omar, and I, and I was going to express a very similar sentiment that I, I'd like that Ariel is opening up more. Uh, I will say this, though, as, just as a caveat. I want there to be somebody else. Not not that I don't like Ariel. I, yeah. I love Ariel. I want there to be others. I want more. And uh, I feel like for me, Luke Thomas is almost always a, a close second because I, I consume a lot of his content and a lot of his media as well. Um, yeah, that's it. His, the the oh, digestion. Dad Hardy. I, lo I love Dan Hardy's Oh, yeah. dude, yes. I just, Facts. towards the end of the year, Mark, you, you uh, showed me Dan Hardy's podcast and his YouTube show. Love it. Yeah, I could watch love him it. talk yeah, yeah. about Dan Hardy's go. for like yes. the entire day. Yes. I, watch, I can watch Dan Hardy breakdowns the same way I can watch a Robin Black breakdown robin black sure. is fantastic when it comes to breaking down fights and moments and stuff like that i love that dude um he's also got a personality of his own that's kind of fun um yeah but luke thomas for me man is very difficult to digest he like, can be if we're talking about long form and like yep. listening to whole shows and I shit agree. i can't do it I man agree. i can't do it like i can listen to a clip or a take from him but i can't i can't do long form with him well, he's different from Ariel. Like Ariel is never going to give you his like oh yeah for sure. analysis, but Luke Luke seems to have a, quite a bit of of fighting knowledge and training knowledge. He he trains. So, yeah 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 yeah. And he was a it's marine, amazing. I think. It's is he really? I didn't know that. It's amazing how him. Ariel is such a large figure in the MMA world, yeah. while rarely breaking down MMA. Like, yeah, it's it doesn't make a lot of sense. He started oh, as yeah. a journalist. He's got a hell of a niche that he created for himself. Yeah. yeah, And that's why I think that he, he's so successful is because he's doing something that people don't – that not only people aren't doing, but they're not good at doing as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Agreed. Interviewing people is a very, very difficult thing. You can see it – anytime you watch a, 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 a interview with like fucking actors that are promoting a movie, those interviews are awful. And I can only imagine how, yeah. how boring and like – how many people want to put needles in their eyes having to go through those interviews with a lot of these chooch ass reporters that are just doing it, you know, because they have to because of their job or whatever. But Ariel takes a real pride in what he does, you know, and a lot of times you can see he, 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 he crosses some lines sometimes. Like he's not always, you know, a hundred percent with how he approaches certain things. Sometimes he gets a little cringe with it and a little like back the fuck up. Um, but he's always been the, the one thing, like I said, and I, and I said this uh, with the Dylan Dennis thing, and I, I even said this when the when the Dana White, Patty Pimblett nonsense went down. Ariel, I don't think has ever lied publicly. I don't. I, I've never mm. considered him to be a liar. I've never considered things that he said to be untrue or fabricated or or embellished. He seems to always be pretty fucking accurate with the things that he says, which is a lot more consistent than you can say, I think, for any pundit in MMA. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I will say this one last thing. Ariel is also the only guy who puts out YouTube content and all kinds of content. He has the most dead space in his shows. He can just stop talking for like 45 seconds. And you're like, is this still playing? And it is. He just like doesn't have to he doesn't feel the need to like push his show forward like everybody else does, like we do. Yeah. I'm jealous. Okay, next category. Referee of the year. Omar, who you got? I, uh, in order for me to pick this, my thought process was what referees have pissed me off the least this year? And I went with my boy, Jason Herzog. That will be my pick. Nice. Mark? Considered Herzog, I think he is my silver medalist. Um, I went with Mark Smith. You never hear people talk about him. I think that's a great sign. He's authoritative. He doesn't miss anything. He's a great ref. I think that 
I thought about him the least of any ref all year, which in my book makes you the best ref. Yes. A referee, a good referee is like a lawn. You only notice it when something's wrong. You get it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, my pick was also Mark Smith. Oh. I've grown to really, really like his refereeing. Uh, totally echo your sentiment, Mark. He's, he's authoritative. I, I love how he's super clear in the octagon. When something happens, if there's a an incidental low blow or an eye poke, he's so clear. He like yells, stop, like so clear. I'm like, oh, that's so nice. Uh, so yeah, he's the fucking man. And I feel like I, I can't recall an early stoppage or a, a bad late stoppage from him. He's just good all, all around, man. He's great. I think I find Mark Smith just a smidge theatrical for me. He's oh, just, yeah? He's just a little on the extra side with the way he does the refereeing. I prefer Jason Herzog's more human approach to refereeing. Mark Smith is just, he's just a little, it's just a little too much for me. He's a good referee. Totally. I have grown to like him more than I liked him last year. I will say that. Um, sure. But just a bit too theatrical for yeah, man. So I, I still love Herzog, man. He's the best. Oh, yeah. He's great. Okay, next category. Coach of the year. Uh, I will go first this time. For my coach of the year, I had Eugene Berman, coach over at City Kickboxing. Uh, let's see, just rattling off some of his fighters' results this year. Uh, Carlos Olberg went 3-0 with two finishes. Uh, Tyson Pedro, 2-0, two finishes. Dan Hooker coming off a nice back uh, bounce back win. TKO against uh, Claudio Puyas. Kaikar France. UD over Ascar. Got to a title fight against Moreno. Lost that one. Volk went 2-0. Dominated. Izzy went 2-1. Uh, who you guys got? Mark? So I went with a duo because I didn't know which one is like, you know, they are a duo. And it's uh, Habib Nurmagomedov and Javier Mendez. They went 19-2 and two on the year. Islam became the lightweight champ of the UFC. Usman became the lightweight champ in Bellator. Umar has risen through the ranks. They had Bilal turn in one of his best performances ever once he linked up with them. They have Godzi as a rising star in Bellator who just showed out on the New Year's Eve card. There's a lot of guys there, and 19-2 and two is a hell of a record. I do have one honorable mention, but I will let Omar give Wait, his. so it's Khabib and who? Javier Mendez. Javier Mendez, okay. Yeah, those are mine. That was exactly oh, what wow. I had to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Khabib, Khabib now is, and he's not only taking the role of Abdul Manap, but he's also taking the figure of Abdul Manap, and he has gone full yep. Abdul Manap yep. in 2022. Um, yep. And he's done it. He's done it. I mean, the, the strides that him and his team have made uh, since he's become coach, I think have, it, it's, it's hard to argue. It's hard to ignore. So, yeah. Khabib, I, I, I had Khabib by himself because I thought Khabib was the, personally, I thought Khabib was the biggest difference in that camp. Um, but we can throw Javier Mendez in there as well. I'm fine with that. I just felt weird saying Khabib without saying Mendez, considering like Mendez was Khabib's head coach and anything Khabib is doing is kind of like with him. So like, I, I felt weird not, not. But to me, that's, it's. It's kind of like the lineage, though. Like, I feel like by saying Khabib, you kind of automatically give the credit to Abdul, to, to Mendez, and to, like, the guys that gave it Fair. to Khabib. Fair. Um, but because I think Khabib at this point is the day-to-day -day guy. I think he's the one who's now doing yeah, a lot of the, 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 the abusive trainings that go on in AKA. <laughs> yeah. My honorable mention that I wanted to throw out, just because I feel like he doesn't get a lot of love, is for Nelly Feliz Sr., I don't know how much credit to give him, considering he's mainly a boxing coach. But despite that, he apparently does kind of serve as the head coach as well for both Glover and Alex Pereira. And he had both mm -hmm. of them win titles in the same year. So that's a pretty good resume, and I feel like it's a guy who no one really brings up. So I wanted to, wanted to give him a little shout-out. Nice. Yeah. I didn't even know who that was when you said it, so there you go. All right, this one was kind of difficult for me to pick. I'm, I'm curious to hear your guys' picks. Breakout Fighter of the Year. Omar, why don't you go I first? Names. I, don't fucking list. Yeah. I won't say them all. Yeah, I, I, this, was another, this was hard for me to pick. I, I, when I kind of got down to it, I chose Alex Pereira 
Um, oh, okay. And the reason why I That's did is pick. because Alex Pereira is on a very short list of fighters who has won a UFC title within a year of joining the UFC. Um, I think he came in at the end of 2021, like November or something like that. And yeah. by the middle of 2022, has was the champion of the middleweight division. Um, four fights total, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is another you know thing that is a handful only a handful of people have been able to do um anderson silva off the top of my head i think had one fight in the ufc before he got a title shot um it's not a it's it's not a common thing to have happen so i, I thought this year Pereira was the one who climbed the rankings i think the fastest the highest um and ended up making a big splash at the end winning the title mark so i got a bunch of honorables i want to just mention should i do that after or now? Do, do it after. first. Do them first. No, do them first. Oh, okay, do it. Fine, do it first. And then save <laughs> save the grand finale. All right. Um, I won't say all these. I have too many names on this fucking list. But um, I wanted to mention um, Shavkat Rachmanov. I think he has come through as a nice force and a name to watch at welterweight. Wanted to mention both Brendan Lochnein and Olivier Albon Mercier for their runs in PFL. I thought those were really mm. significant for their careers. Christian Lee for coming back and retaking his lightweight belt and then also taking the welterweight belt in 1FC. Marlon Vera for the career jump he has taken. He kind of already was taking it in 2021, but put even more of a stamp on it in 2022. Um, Hamza Chemaev, who we have mentioned here again, similar. He kind of did it in 2021, did it even more in 2022. And then I get to, like, my top few here. Um, Johnny Eblen, who kind of came out of absolutely nowhere to beat the brakes off Gegard Mousasi and become the middleweight champ. Larissa Pacheco, who I mean, someone yeah. That yeah. no one gave a chance to against Kayla and, and got one of the biggest wins of uh, in women's MMA this year. Probably the biggest win in, in women's MMA this year. Um, I think so. And then my runner-up, I will say Sergei Pavlovich, a guy who started his UFC run. He missed all of 2021, returned in 2022, and all he did was knock out Shamil Abdurahimov, Derek Lewis, and Tai Tuivasa consecutively. My breakout fighter of the year, Alex Pereira. It's, it's very hard to give it to someone else. When you make a UFC debut, at the very end of 2021 and you're the champion by the end of 2022 it's it's very hard to not give you the breakout fighter of the year so i know i said a lot of names there just had some people i wanted to be able to shout out but my breakout fighter of the year is the middleweight champion Alex Pereira. okay i feel stupid because i uh, quite honestly got i didn't even think about Pereira for this category because all of the lists <laughs> that I've seen and consulted on the internet have him either winning fighter of the year or on the list for fighter of the year. I mean, that's also fair. So I didn't even think of him. So I, I went back and forth. My honorable mention is Aaron Blanchfield. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I, well, I, I remember that Mark kind of mentioned her in this category last year, yep. but I felt mm -hmm. like this year she took an even bigger step up. In notoriety uh two fights both finishes uh over jj aldrich and completely killing the hype train of molly mccann and thereby stealing her hype for herself uh but and for a very similar reason i ultimately went with cheeto vera uh for a similar reason of kind of another big step up in notoriety and climbing up the rankings more and more i mean she has been around for a minute um yeah. But especially with that finish over Dominic Cruz, such a legend to, to do that to a guy of that stature, um, I felt it really has put Cheeto on the map in a big way. Uh, but now I feel like an idiot because clearly it should be Pereira. <laughs> clearly. But I'll, I'll stay with my pick and I'll say uh, I'll stick with Cheeto. I like it. I like it. Yeah, man. Okay. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Okay, another interesting category, underappreciated fighter of the year, or most most underappreciated fighter of the year. 
I had, again, I had a hard time with this one. So I'll go first this time, and I'll say due to his recent performance over Kevin Holland, I said Stephen Wonderboy Thompson because he's a guy who's a veteran who's been around for a while, and I think well, fans of the welterweight division have maybe grown complacent to the uh, to the wonders that is Wonderboy. And he has reminded us of why he is one of the most exciting 170-pounders in the world. Omar? So my pick was actually Jack De La Maddalena. Um, I don't think enough people are giving this kid credit for the performances that he's putting on. He is absolutely annihilating people left and right. Um, and I don't I, – I, the man is not getting nearly enough coverage or love – for the performances that he's been putting on. Um, I think it sucks. I think we see people with performances that are not even close to as good getting more love. Um, and I hope that 2023 is the year for Jack De La Maddalena because if the man keeps putting on performances for me to watch of that caliber up in the rankings, I, I, we'll be all so lucky. The man's a beast, and, and I hope 2023 is his year. Okay, Mark. Talking about another guy that just got rocketed up the ranks from Danny Roberts to Randy Brown. Facts. Um, all right, I got a few honorables. Really, I can I can lump most of these into the same thought process. I'll give you five guys that went three and zero this year. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, five guys that went three and zero this year that I that I want to make sure get some acknowledgement. Drew Dober just capped it off with a huge KO of Bobby Green. Jonathan mm. Pierce who just uh, kind of broke through by taking out Darren Elkins. Damon Jackson, who just finished Pat Sabatini. Jonathan Martinez, who just brutalized Cub Swanson. And Saeed Nurmagomedov, mm. who just choked out uh, Kakramano. So all three of those guys, all five of those guys, excuse me, went 3-0 and this year and had massive years and, and should be appreciated for the years that they had. A lot of guys Facts. fought once in a whole cal calendar year. So going 3-0 and is, uh, is relevant. My runner-up, I will say Liz Carmouche. I just, I've kind of made this point on here. I just feel like turning back Juliana Velasquez twice, reigning as the Bellator champion at her age, is something that should be getting more credit than it seems to be getting in, in general mainstream MMA. Um, my winner, just because, again, in terms of mainstream MMA, is Larissa Pacheco. Nice. She killed three girls in a matter of minutes and capped it off by beating the previously unbeatable Kayla Harrison. And I think most casual fans still have no idea who she is. And if you yeah. told me today she was fighting Amanda Nunez, I would be fucking pumped to watch that fight. So for that to be the case and most people not to even know who she is, despite the year she just had, I think she does fit the bill. So I will go with Larissa Pacheco. Nice. That's a good, that's a good one. I will add, um, Jack De La Maddalena did go three, and zero this year as well. Um, yes, I didn't. I wasn't saying everybody who did. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I just wanted to add that because you you did put that out there. So I just wanted to, in case people were wondering, um, Jonathan Martinez is a fantastic call out for underappreciation, though. That is, that fight with Cub Swanson was something to remember. That was a, one of the one of, one of the more beautiful performances I think we saw in twenty twenty two. Yeah, I, I love the Larissa Pacheco pick as well. You're absolutely right about all that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, comeback fighter of the year. So this is not meaning within a single fight. That's the next category. This means a fighter who has come back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, take it first. All right. I uh, only got a few here. I'll, I'll mention Jamal Hill. Um, 2021, he kind of had his momentum stopped uh, in the loss to Paul Craig. He came back, had a big year in 2022, and now finds himself in a title fight. So that was a big one. Uh, I, I mentioned this one earlier, Christian Lee. He lost his belt in 2021, came back and reclaimed it, and then became double champ in 2022. So definitely a big bounce back year for him. Uh, my runner-up, I will say Mighty Mouse, Demetrius Johnson who had been beaten by Adriano Marais, was able to rebound, take his title uh, back by finishing Marais this year and kind of remind everyone that he might still be the best flyweight on planet Earth, for all we know. But my comeback fighter of the year, 
will be Patricio Pitbull. Wow, nice. He was finished, obviously, by A.J. McKee uh, late in 2021. It kind of felt like, I think, to all of us that his reign was over, that McKee was the new guy, that maybe we were going to start to see Pitbull, you know, fading a little bit. And instead, whatever you want to say about the decision, he came back, took his belt right back from A.J. McKee in the rematch, defended against Adam Boric, who people thought was going to be an interesting test, and he absolutely shut down Adam Boric, and then just went ahead and uh, won another fight on, on New Year's Eve on a, on a huge rising card. So a big comeback year for Patricio Pit- Pitbull for a guy who some people thought his time was maybe done at the end of 2021 to come back and be still reigning as he is. Nice. Omar. Uh, so my comeback fighter of the year is Zhang Wei Li. Uh, Zhang Wei Li lost twice in 2021, obviously lost her belt uh, to Rose Nama Yunus early in 2021, and then lost the rematch uh, in a hard-fought split decision to Rose again in November of 2021. Regardless of how you thought that fight went, she ain't win that goddamn belt, and she didn't win all of 2021. Those were two big losses. The first time she lost two fights back to back in her career. Um, And, you know, we know that she made a lot of changes, changes to her camp, changes to her hair, changes to the Zhang Wei Li that we knew prior to the first Rose Nama Yunus fight. Um, Made, I think, significant changes in her life in general. I believe she also moved to the U.S. from China, made a lot of different changes. Comes back in June of 2022 and puts the absolute ass whooping on Joanna Janjacek. Um, granted, Joanna had one foot out the door, and there are a lot of things we can say about Joanna's performance and where her head was at there. But the fact is, is Joanna, I think, is still to a certain extent Joanna. Uh, and Zhang Weili kind of showed that her level is still up there um, and laid out Joanna pretty badly. Then, November of 2022, she fights Carla Esparza. Sparza, the first round, I've argued, his, was relatively competitive, all things considered. But once we got into that second round, it was all Zhang Wei Li. She put a real disparity in the skill level, I thought, between the two of them. Locked in a rear, uh, a modified rear naked choke. And for me, becomes the breakout, uh, comeback fighter of the year. It's a great pick. Didn't even think of her. Uh, I have sort of a unconventional pick, a guy who hasn't, bounced back from a loss, although I consider it a loss, kind of. Uh, I went with Aljamain Sterling, a guy who was really getting worked in his first fight against Piotr Jan, ends up winning by disqualification from an illegal knee, uh, took a ton of shit for seeming like he was milking the illegal knee and kind of acting, and people were, all, you know, the entire time for like months and months were like, he's the best actor, give the guy an Oscar, also coming off of a surgery, the rematch got pushed back because of surgery and complications. So a guy who was battling a ton of demons, he went in. The fight, the second fight was still a split decision, so it was still a fairly close fight, although most people had Sterling winning. I, I, I had him winning that fight by unanimous decision. Yeah. Um, and then he came back, and he, he looked great against TJ, although that fight is kind of weird, too, because TJ's arm was, like, detached. Uh, so I went with Aljo. That's a great pick also. I didn't think of either one of those, and uh, I like them both. <clears throat> Remember that image of uh, Sterling when he when he made weight for the rematch, and he, like, screamed and, like, started kind of getting emotional? And he was like, I, he, like it's been a long road to get to this point. Yep. I yep. remember that. That was a very memorable moment. Uh Okay, now we're going to do comeback of the year. I'm going to go first this time because I think this one is fucking easy. I'm just going to get out of the way. Easily, easily, Edwards defeating Usman, UFC 278. Oh, my God. Unbelievable moment. And uh, was losing almost the entire fight. Was getting worked. Usman looks like Usman, just kind of durable, unbreakable until Edwards just found that chink in the armor, man, and he put him out cold. Comeback of the year. What do you guys have? Yeah, uh, I guess I'll take it. Uh, Shout out to Matt Schnell. 
over Sumaderji because yes. it was fucking unbelievable. Oh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, bud. You're you're in a tough category, my friend, because <laughs> the answer is obviously Leon Edwards over Kamaru Usman. I mean, it was literally a Rocky movie that played out on our screens in a UFC fight from the fucking words in the corner to the way the fight was going to the way he timed the head kick, the celebration, all of it. It's, it is the definition of a comeback of the year. Yes. Omar. I would agree, but I don't. Uh Oh, <gasps> well, I'm going to go with Alex Pereira's KO over Israel Adesanya. And here's why. Wow. Wow. And here's why. I personally think Israel Adesanya was winning that fight. The first round, if you yes. remember properly, uh, or uh, Pereira was seconds away from getting laid the fuck out. He got rocked. He was turned yes. the complete other way from where Israel was standing, and he was in a bad way. Luckily for him, there was like five seconds left, ten seconds left, whatever the hell it was that didn't allow enough time for for real capitalization on that rock to be to be taken. Um, I think he lost the next couple rounds, the next few rounds. And then by the time he got to the fifth round, you know, he was still, he was always a threat. But I think, I still think that Izzy was winning those rounds. And when we got to the fifth round, I don't think he had any way of winning that fight other than knocking out Israel Adesanya. And, mm -hmm. and he did it, man. And he did it. And he did it against a guy who had not lost at middleweight. Um, he did it against a guy who, you know, has pretty much unanimously by the MMA community been considered at this point the the best middleweight fighter we've seen, if not ever, since Anderson Silva. Mm -hmm. um, and Alex Pereira went in there like <laughs> like if he was Chris Weidman and put the beat on him in the, at the very end. And I think it was a big, big comeback for him, a big moment for him and his team. Um, and it leads, I think, for an even greater storyline for a second, a third, no, second rematch, third fight. Wow. All right. Very Third cool. Now, fourth fight. Fourth fight. They fought twice no, in they kickboxing. Had, they, had one re they had two fights in kickboxing, so that's one rematch. Yeah. And then right. the second rematch. So third rematch. Fourth. fourth oh, third rematch, fourth fight. I got you. I got you. Yes. <laughs> yes. A different kind oh. of MMA man. Uh, All right, boys. Here we go. I will also say, as far as the, the Rocky comparison with the corners... The Alex Pareto corner did the same thing. Yeah. The biggest yeah. difference, the biggest difference is it just sounded cooler coming from the Usman corner. Yeah, You know man. what I mean? The Edwards corner. Come on, yeah, son. Yeah. Uh, come on, yeah. son. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to go for it, Rocky. Come on, son. And his name like, is Rocky, which helps. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's just tastefully just a bit better. You know what I mean? It just tastes <laughs> a little bit better. But the content yeah. was the same, you know? Yes. I mean, also, just, just to compare them, since we're comparing them, Pereira kind of took the fourth round off, and I was like, this dude's going to get finished in this round, because he's, like, not fighting. He looked so gassed in round four. Yeah. And it, 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 I was like, is he gassed, and he's, like, going to die, or is he kind of trying to save it for the fifth? It turns out that the latter was kind of the right thing, and like, he came out in the fifth fucking blazing, uh, whereas Edwards was just getting worked the whole fight. Did Edwards win like round one? one. Maybe one, one, yeah. One. But not like dominantly. No, he got a takedown and, and kind of. He got the take. That's right. Okay. Anyway, okay, let's go on. Submission of the year. Uh, Omar, take it first this time. I'm going to apologize to the homeboy here because uh, you already know what's coming mark you are you I already don't. know what's coming what what's coming is islam mahachev's arm triangle uh. over the boy charles Oliveira. i mean come on guys you you gonna tell me you gonna tell me that this man chokes out super saiyan charles Oliveira, and we're not gonna give him submission of the year come on dog you got to you got to okay <laughs> that's a good point um it's funny, for my KO, I kind of thought about it in terms of, like, the magnitude of the moment. But for sub, for some reason, I focused, like, purely on technique. And I didn't really factor in magnitude of the moment, which if you do, that's a great pick. 
Um, I, I narrowed it to two. One was more relevant, so I felt I had to include it, but it is probably my second place, which is Jessica Andraj and her standing mm, arm triangle stick. choke of, Am- of yes. Amanda Lemos, where she just lets go and drops her to the ground. I mean, this is your was- second place? Yeah. Okay. That was incredible. Um, yeah. But my sub of the year goes to, and I don't even remember how to say this man's last name because I haven't seen him fight since this, and that was the first time I ever watched him fight. Um, I don't even think I watched it live. I think I went back and watched it. Luca Poklet or Poklet? I believe it's Luca Poklet in Bellator over Dante Skiro. The man more or less invented a choke. Even BJJ <laughs> studs were like, I don't know what that just was. So if you have not seen this, go watch it. Luca Poklet over Dante Skiro. They now call it the Luganator Choke. And you absolutely need to go watch it if you have not seen it. It was an unbelievable finish. Was that that kind of like inverted triangle? It was, yes, an inverted arm triangle. Oh, wow. It was, they were kind of in a dual headlock position with their heads under each other's arms. You just, you got to watch it. I can't even, it doesn't make sense is is really the best way to describe it. It almost looks like a modified guillotine, honestly. It's a one armed yeah. modified guillotine. It's they, it is they very just, fucked up looking. The best this, the 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 most oftenly attempted way I heard it described was a modified arm triangle, which I can't even really see how they're saying it's that. But I I just I give up on trying to define what that submission is. And he puts him out cold. It's this is not a tap, people. He chokes a man out. Oh yeah, and the no. commentary didn't even know a choke was happening. <laughs> So eyes yeah, open, like, boy is looking up at heaven right now. Boy. Big John is literally going like, "What an interesting position these two guys are stuck in!" And, and wait, it, oh my God, he's out cold! Like it was, it was wild. So yeah, go go watch it if you have not. Okay. Uh, mine. Okay, my honorable mention was Jessica Andrade standing mm-hmm. arm triangle against Lemos, and my submission of the year. It was. More so of like the magnitude of the moment, and the, and like and the image that we got. So mine was Matt Schnell choking yeah. out Sumaderji. Fuck, I should have that on my list. UFC on ABC. This is on ABC, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the image of this is like this was also. I don't. Okay, I won't spoil it for later. The image of Matt Schnell doing the money signs. Yes. Laying there with Sumaderji un- unconscious. Like covered in blood, covered, covered in, blood. in blood, combined with the comeback that Matt Schnell had, it was just incredible. It was fucking incredible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this will be. This might be interesting. KO of the year. Who wants to go first? I'll go first with this one. Okay. This one, for me, was Leon Rocky Edwards versus Usman. That was. If you take away the moment, if you take away all of it, that head kick is fucking disgusting. It was nasty. I mean, there's there's not a ton of head kicks you see that land as clean and as perfect as that one did. And it needs to be a poster somewhere. It needs to be it needs to be all the things. That should be a fucking refrigerator <laughs> magnet, frankly. Like it needs to be all yes. the things. So knockout of the year. Okay. Mark. All right, I'll give you a few quick that I'll try to rattle off that are honorable mentions i wanted to make sure we shouted out alex caceres after the props we just gave him last week i felt like he he deserved a shout out on this list i loved that same side combo that he finished with a head kick knocking out juliana rosa uh molly mccann and her spinning elbow of luana carolina was absolutely filthy michael chandler front kicking tony ferguson's Mm. face into next week Mm -hmm. uh the main three i want to i want to highlight Gotta shout out Irene Aldana with a heel kick from the ground to the body oh, of a right. standing Macy Chasson. Yes. Never seen it before in my life. Absolutely deserves a, a shout out on this award show. That was an unbelievable finish. Um, I had a hard time deciding on my KO of the year because I was debating moment versus technique. Right, 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 right. I went with the moment one as my KO of the year. The technique one that I have loved from the second I ever saw it 
is Demetrius Johnson's running knee KO of Adriano Marais. Marais, yeah. Just the amount of steps that he had to take with a falling, stumbling Marais where nothing is getting thrown and he's just following him and, and timing it and running as Marais is falling and perfectly launches into the most accurate knee you've ever seen. That that was my KO of the year technique-wise. Easy. My... You, should, you can even give credit to the uh, to the setup of it as well because the, the way that, that that sequence started, he ducks under a punch, oh, yeah. comes oh, back yeah. with, a, with a counter cross, and then that's what sends uh, Adriano yep. stumbling back to begin with. Yep. The whole sequence is fucking crazy. Yeah, 100%. And just to even throw the knee in that spot, chasing a stumbling guy – and to be like, what I'm going to do here is a flying knee like it. it, it to, yeah, hurt. to know, to know, to have seen what you were going to do in that moment. And like for none yeah. of it to be a surprise is, is yeah. fucking, it's only DJ stuff. Agree. But yes. I, I factored in the moment. So I have the same pick as Omar for my official pick, which is the Leon Edwards KO of Kamaru Usman. It's just, you know, the as soon as you hear KO of the year, the one that flashes into your yeah. brain that you will never forget is when Leon Edwards took the title off Kamaru Usman. I'm gonna tell you right now, if if uh, Jan uh, had finished this boy with those leg kicks, with those shin kicks, that might have been in my honorable mentions because oh for sure, oh, when yeah. the hell do you ever see that? Yeah, when? Yeah, it's crazy. Mike? Okay, my my honorable mentions. Cheeto knocking out Cruz, devastating. <clears throat> yep. Also, Shattered one of my favorites, Tai Tuivasa knocks out Derek Lewis with that short elbow pressing him against the cage. Derek Lewis dips his head down and just vanishes into oblivion. <laughs> uh, speaking, just sticking right here for heavyweight. Uh, interesting note. Thinking of myself and as all of us, none of of Sergey Pavlovich's knockouts. Are even on my radar because he just he just like clobbers guys and yes, like it's you. you're right. <laughs> uh, also, honorable mention, uh, Ilya Topuria just putting Jai oh. Herbert into another orbit. Yes. Uh, and my last honorable mention is Chandler's front kick against Tony was devastating, but we are unanimous. Mm. It just has to be Leon Rocky Edwards winning the welterweight belt against Usman with that fifth round Hail Mary head kick. Just never going to forget it, right? It's like it's like what you're it, that's the one that you're always going to remember from this year. Yeah. Yep. Uh All quick right. side note. Somebody tried to fight Ila Tapuri at a bar. Needless to say, it didn't go that man's way. So there's yeah. there's that smartest decision that person ever made i don't i don't get it i don't get it <laughs> okay fight of the year boys i will go first this time uh i'm interested to see if we are unanimous or if we're all over the place i think we might be unanimous here for me the fight of the year for me it had to be glover versus yuri ufc 275 for the light heavyweight strap uh, judging from the nodding that's going on by my two co-hosts. I mean, this fight had it all, man. It just had it all. Yeah. It had it. It was action on stop. We got the best of, of Yuri. We got the best of Glover. We got submission attempts. We got, we had a, a great striking knockdowns and we got a finish. And, uh, Yuri took his throne, man, as, as most of us thought he would. All right, Mark, take it. Yeah, I had this down to two. I don't even have more honorable mentions than that. My runner-up that I really did debate was Hamza Chimaev and Gilbert Burns. Oh, yes. That thing was just a war. I will never forget that fight etched in my brain. I loved the just the, the will that both guys showed in that fight. I may have even been more into that fight in the moments than I was into my winning fight. But my fight of the year will also be Glover Teixeira and Yuri Prohaska. It was sloppy in a lot of ways. Oddly mm -hmm. and confusingly sloppy at times. But
But it was never not a fight and an incredible fight and a back and forth fight and a thousand momentum swings. And that's what a fight of the year is. So yep. it's got to be them. Yep. All right, Omar. Yeah, when I was picking this fight, I had to kind of think about what fight of the year really meant for me. And, and you know, if I was going to be picking essentially a performance within a fight of the year or whether I was going to be picking kind of a competitive yeah. back and forth, you know, momentum shifting fight. Um, when I was in that process, I landed on Glover versus uh, or Yuri versus Glover as my number one pick because of all the momentum shift shifts, um, but also because of the competitive nature of it as well, right? Like you never, there was at no point in that fight where you knew what was going to happen, where you knew, you know, th that, that Glover was going to end up winning in this round or, or, or winning that or like that shit was all over the place. They were going back as the, the moment where you thought Glover was, Oh, Glover, Glover's getting him. Glover's getting him. And then Yuri fucked him up. Like it was, it was a lot of back and forth up until right up until the very end of that fight. Um, Definitely an exciting fight to watch. I had, and I continue to have, the Volkanovski versus Korean Zombie fight in my head. It is not a competitive fight. But, God damn it, was it one of the most impressive and... Yeah. I, I mean, that has to be one of the greatest performances, one-sided performances ever. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it's, it will never leave my head. And so, it was a hard... Here. Yeah, I, I had to sort of like think about the fact that that's not the fight of the year, but it kept coming up every time I kept thinking about it. So I'm going to I'm going to shout that out as an honorable mention because of that. Um, but I'm going to go with Yuri versus Glover. Nice. Nice. OK. Fighter of the year. Omar, let's stick with you right here and just uh, spit it out. Give it to us. Uh, my fighter of the year is Alexander Volkanovsky. Alexander Volkanovsky is like one godfruit away from becoming a, a living legend, a living entity. Like the man is absolutely crazy. I've never seen it's been it's it's a rare day for us to see at this point somebody that dominant uh, at this level of MMA. We used to see I feel like this kind of dominance a lot when when styles were still very stringent right when you like when you would see real different stylistic matchups between guys who were big into the muay thai or big into kickboxing like whatever it was um but now with guys being so much more well-rounded you rarely see these significant types of one-sided ass beatings and i feel like volkanovsky delivers on more than one i just think the korean zombie one was just on a different level but it's not the only one that he's had <clears throat> um i mean he's made max look human normal like like he's not the max holloway that he is in every other fight that he's in um i just think volkanovsky at this point in the entire ufc roster is the one who is on a completely different level so alexander volkanovsky mark this one was a bit hard um give you a few honorables um I thought Wei Li deserved a shout out for kind of the points that Omar made earlier. Um, KO's Joanna subs Carla to become the champion. Big year for her. Leon Edwards obviously had a huge fight, huge finish, huge moment. We've been talking about him throughout these awards, but it was only one fight, so I felt like it could not be him with only one fight in the calendar year. Uh, Sergei Pavlovich, I mentioned him earlier, three KOs in the heavyweight division. That's a huge year. Um, my top three, Volk, for all the reasons that Omar just said. The dude is incredible. He's such a level above. Alex Pereira, for the reasons we have said throughout this award show as well. Uh, just the ascension, knocking out Sean Strickland, knocking out Izzy. I didn't go with either Volk or Pereira for my fighter of the year. Um, Pereira, because he was kind of losing the fight. I didn't love the finish, so it wasn't so definitive for me. Volk, I really debated. In the end, I am going to make our viewers who like to comment happy. Oh, My fighter of the year is Islam Mahachev. Yeah, put that Dominance in the tag, baby. That this man showed, and I, you know how highly I rate Charles Oliveira. 
to walk through Bobby Green and then do what he did against Charles Oliveira to beat him on the feet the way that he did to choke out Charles Oliveira in round two, take the title. I think if I had to pick a fighter whose year this most was, I think I'd have to say Islam Mahachev. Okay. My honorable mentions for fighter of the year. <clears throat> We're Zhang. 2-0. Dominant both times. But what held her back, I think, and I'd say this with all due respect to both ladies, both former champs, was strength of competition. Don't crucify me. You know, you my doc, my my love for Joanna is well documented on the show. That's all I'll say. I'm not gonna do the voice. <laughs> uh, I also had Alex Pereira honorable mention. I totally agree with Mark. I was gonna say the exact same sentiment that because he was pretty much losing that fight all the way up, all the way up until that last moment, that last barrage, that held him back for me. Uh, and Islam was like runner up, like one A for me for his dominance to do what he did against, uh, against, uh, Charles was just incredible, but it also, again, lost a few points for me for his only two, his only other fight in the year was Bobby Green. So, so again, strength and competition. So I went with Alexander, the great Volkanovsky for looking as amazing as he's looked against the competition that he has faced. The man is just on another level. And uh, I happily crown him fighter of the year this time. This time around. How about the fact that the two men who we have chosen as the fighters of the year are about to fight? Are about to fight. Yeah. Wow, you're you're right. Yeah. Pretty awesome. And I can't wait. We finally settle that and see really where we're at. Yeah, man. Because these are two guys that have basically not even have barely lost rounds. You know what I mean? I think the Brian Ortega oh, yeah. fight might have been the last time that Volkanovski was in real shit in a fight. Yep. 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 Yeah. 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 I just wish they could make Volk a little bigger or shrink Islam a little bit between now and this <laughs> fight starting. But hey, we'll see what happens. Hey, man, you're not allowed to say that. I am interested to see what Volk looks like, though, at 155 or him cutting to 155 yeah. because he, he might look even better, man. I mean, he's got space to, to gain weight there. I mean, his frame allows for it a little bit. So there's room. It's a it's a well-known number, right? Like what was his like walk around weight when he was a yeah, rugby like player to two, two, 47 oh, or something like that? Oh, was it that? Yeah. Big? When, when he was in when he was rugby. When he was in rugby, he he did walk around at two hundred plus pounds. I can't find exactly how much. Two hundred fourteen pounds. Two hundred five. Two fourteen. Ninety-seven kilograms. Two fourteen. Okay. Okay. Which okay. is ridiculous. Yeah. Last category, gentlemen. Moments of the year. I I love this one. It really because it it just brings up like all such great memories throughout the year. Uh, I'll go first this time. For me, the moment of the year, the first and only one that popped into my head was Leon Edwards' coach yep. or corner screaming at him before the fifth round, well, come on then! Stop feeling sorry for yourself! Oh, I get goosebumps, man. I get goosebumps. It was like a movie. Yes. And I can watch that shit on replay over and over again. So inspirational. He was so defeated. He was. He was so defeated. And it just goes to show oh, you yeah. the power of having a great fucking coach, man. How a coach can pick you up when you can't pick yourself up. Uh, you guys go. Uh, right, I, I will. You go. I was, I, I'll rack off of it just because I'm going to go down the same vein here. Uh, I am also in the, the Leon camp uh, when it comes to this moment of the year. But mine goes a little bit later on once he's won the fight, once he's got the belt in his hand, once they've got a microphone in his hand, and he, he's, just, he's just laying into the world. And he's just, look at me now. You said I couldn't do it. 
Look at me yeah. now. Pound for pound. Headshot. Dead. Let's fucking go. What is, that's one of the greatest fucking things I've ever heard in my life. To tell the whole world you doubted me. Look at me now. Look at me now. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's my moment. That's the only moment in my head. The only one. I'll give you yeah. some honorable mentions. But I'm ending <laughs> up in the same fucking place. Yes. <laughs> uh, three honorables. Charles Oliveira, when he was stripped of his belt. Mm. Screaming before the fight and after the fight. This is kind of a, not a single moment. It's more like a story moment. That the champion has a name. Destroying Justin Gaethje. Yelling it more that, that the champion has a name. That was an awesome one. We've mentioned this one. Bloody Matt Schnell flashing the money signs as he completes the triangle choke submission of Sumaderji was unbelievable. Uh, Nate Diaz submitting Tony Ferguson with 209 on the clock just because. Oh, Jesus. How, yeah. How perfect is that one? Yeah. But yeah. I'm going to the same place. Same Again, I, I kind of was thinking of it as like an overall moment. I love how you guys specified it. I was going to throw out the same exact quotes that Omar did. But the whole thing, from from the way the fight was going, to the corner picking him up, to the timing of the head kick, and then, yes, to, to the mic in his hands, the look at me now, pound for pound head shot dead is – up there as my favorite quote in the history of MMA. The whole thing was just one of the greatest stories I've ever watched in MMA in, in one single fight. Can't go anywhere else. It was literally the best moment. It was like, if you didn't like Leon Edwards before then you, you could not have walked away. Not liking that kid. There's no way. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was such an amazing moment. And we'll see how the rematch goes. But Dude, however, the, did yeah. you see the pictures from this weekend of 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 Usman with uh, something on his hand? No. Dude, he Yo, was I, a, I he sent was you. A... I sent you guys the text message because I had a whole I had a whole conversation oh, on yeah, this right. Facebook group that I'm that I'm a part of where it showed Usman was doing like some. Either, it was either an interview or it was or it was. Um, I know he was also doing some fights, like hosting fights and stuff like that. Yeah, he but he had game. his hand, he had his hand wrapped up, like in yeah. a uh, oh. almost like a cast kind of thing, and so yeah, like everybody's like got their cast or something. Yeah, everybody's got their tinfoil hat on now, and they're all you know, we're all like, well, doesn't look like Usman's gonna make it. Look like Jorge Masvidal about to get his third fucking title shot or whatever number he's on now. So <laughs> we'll see what happens, man. But but Masvidal might be shipping his ass over to London to get that get that fight yeah. finally get that fight. I get it if that's the replacement fight, and I'm obviously fucking here for it. But, God, if you're like Bilal Muhammad, you got to be like, what in the fucking world is going on right now that I'm not getting this fight? For as much as it as it does make sense, it equally makes no sense. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like I it, know what you mean. It, it makes no sense, but I know why they'd be doing it, but it yeah. makes no sense. Oh, yeah, the the – promo videos will be oh rolling. oh and then have them in one of those fucking what are the where they sit them down next to each other and you got a guy in the middle and they just let them talk shit for each other for a half hour yeah yeah yeah, yeah you yeah, could yeah. do one of those that would be fantastic yeah it would it certainly would. oh that fight would sell so hard and way more than a Bilal muhammad fight god bless him oh yeah which is why it would be the one that they go with for sure yeah. sorry Bilal. yeah i mean Bilal, I think, is an infinitely more difficult fight by a, a, a huge margin. Um, but as far as where the interest is, where the drama is, where 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 your where your blood gets boiling because some shit's about to go down, it's 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 the Masvidal fight. Yeah, man. How about some trivia to end the show? Oh, that does it, folks. Ooh. That concludes this year's <laughs> and new. <laughs> MMA show awards. Congratulations to all the winners and all the runners up. You guys can come to Florida individually to collect your prizes. <laughs> yeah, one day we're gonna make we're gonna make plaques and send them out. Oh yeah. We're gonna host a real show one day. 
Yeah. We're going to walk the red carpet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, do we have okay. trivia today? <laughs> once we get, once yeah, we get a real second. show on a real channel, the first thing I'm going to do when we first air is, Look at me now! Look at me now! <laughs> yes. Uh, love love it. it. Okay, here's the trivia. <laughs> what is longer... The number of days of John Jones's longest title reign, or the number of days since his last fight? <laughs> Did you fucking wake uh, up and chose violence today? What? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Well, it's got to be the title reign, right? It's got to be. Uh, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Okay, go ahead. No, no, I go just ahead. in my head. The you said the question one way, and in my head, I heard, what was longer, his success or his time not succeeding? <laughs> uh, Omar, um, what's your pick? 20. 20. <sighs> Shit, at this point, I think it's the latter. I think it's... I. I don't think his it title reign is. Be. He was the champ for so long. Okay, the answer is the answer is the title reign. The answer is the title reign. But it's closer than you think. How close? Are you accounting okay. for the strips and the time that, off that. and all this other? Oh, okay. Well, remember he because his, his shit got he, messy, man. The thing is, is I that he had, said the title reign, the initial title yes, reign. Yes, if it was both title reigns, it would not be close. Okay, his longest title reign was 1,501 days. Yeah, It has been 1,061 days since his last fight. Wow. So it is like Jesus. over a year. 1,061? I didn't even think we were that long yet. Wow. We're coming up on three years wow. since his last time in the cage. Yeah. February of, 20, of 2019. Wow. Wow. So there you go. And there you have it, folks. February of 2020. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Three years. My bad. Wow. And there you have it, folks. Episode 75 in the books. I love it. I love the award episode. It's a fun one. Yeah, it's always fun. We should do more like this during the year. The problem is we always have fucking events. There's too many I know. There's There's too no many time. events. There's we no say time. this all the time. Literally, like, I would love to do ones where we like rank all time. Like you know, today we're gonna do the all time bantam weights or whatever. But there's just always dude, we're, fucking we're, events. We're at two, almost two and a half hours right now, and we didn't have a fight to preview. Like yeah. it's not gonna happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, because we did the awards. But that's and what we I talked mean, a lot like, during the. There's just so between Bellator, the way they matter now, the way PFL has been one FC. Like there's just always shit happening. Like we would have to record twice a week to like. We would, yeah, pull exactly. Up shit, which I also can't do. Yeah, Un until we get picked up <laughs> by ABC and this yeah. becomes all of our full time gigs. Yes. Maybe we just have to give ourselves permission that, like, during the year, if there's just like a really low, like a low grade fight night card. We give ourselves permission to just kind of like skip quick, over it. Quick pick it or something. And then quick pick the whole card in like 15 minutes. Uh, or quick pick like the main event and like the other three good fights on the main card and be like, see you next week regarding this card. But now we're going to do like our all time middleweight. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. See, it's nice these weeks because like we did a recap and we could do this. Next week we're going to do right. predictions for the year, but we're also going to preview a card. When it's only one, it's doable. It's just that almost every other week we have recaps and previews. So yes, like, that's when yes. it's like fucking impossible. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. We're recording right now, huh? I'm kind we of are. Thinking like I'm just talking to you guys. All right, let's fucking cap this thing off. <laughs> that's how it should be. If you've been sticking with us, thank you so much. Enjoy your weekends. Happy New Year, of course. Yes, sir. Don't hit your spouse, especially if you're the man. Don't hit your fucking wife, ever. Unless you're like Unless... Omar and his wife allows it. Then you can hit your wife and allow your wife to hit you. That's just called As training. Optional. That's called well, training. Yes. I hope. 
Yes, it is. I hope there's people who just click into the end of this episode. All right, folks. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Uh, peace. Peace.